Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the astrological forecast for November of 2023. Joining me today is Austin Kopic. Hey, Austin. Hey, Chris. How's it going? It's going. It's uh, It's been a month, and we have another big month coming up. So in this episode, we're going to spend the first hour talking about news and recent events since our last forecast episode. Uh, and then in the second hour, we're going to jump ahead and look at the astrological forecast for November and do a deep dive into the astrology coming up over the next four weeks. As always, there's timestamps either below this video on YouTube or on the podcast website. If you want to jump ahead to the forecast section or other sections of the podcast, feel free to use that. Um, so first, before we get into the news, let me give you just a brief preview of the astrology of November using our planetary alignments calendar. So we start off the month actually coming in off of a lunar eclipse in Taurus, which is actually taking place at the very end of October. And we're going to talk a little bit about this at the beginning of the forecast. But our first major astrological um, correlation at the beginning of the month besides that is Saturn is stationing direct at zero degrees of Pisces on the 4th of November. Then the following week, Venus is moving into the sign of Libra on the 8th. Mercury is going into Sagittarius on the 10th. There's a tough-looking Mars-Uranus opposition, which is taking place on the 11th of November. Then we get our first lunation of the month, which is a new moon in the sign of Scorpio on the 13th. Then we have a rare Sun-Mars conjunction in Scorpio, which takes place on the 18th. Uh, the Sun moves into Sagittarius on the 22nd, Mars into Sagittarius on the 24th, then Mars immediately squares Saturn in Pisces on the 25th, and then we get our second lunation of the month, which is a full moon in the sign of Gemini on the 27th of November. All right, so that's the quick overview of the forecast we'll be talking about later in the episode, but first let's do a little bit of news and other stuff to catch us up on how the astrology has played out over the past few weeks since our last forecast at the end of last month. Um, so of course, you know, the big thing that's been happening over the past few weeks is the the war that's happening in Israel and Palestine. Um, where on October 7th, there was a massive surprise attack that was launched on Israel by Hamas, and there were 1,400 Israelis killed and 200 hostages taken. And then subsequently, Israel retaliated with many airstrikes, and there's been reportedly over 5,000 Palestinian um, casualties, many of them civilians that have been killed so far. Um, so Israel is currently preparing to launch a ground invasion into Gaza and has cut off food, water, and fuel for the past two weeks since the attacks. And there's protests taking place all around the world and calls for a ceasefire. So that was basically the main thing I think that's dominated most of the past month. And, um, you know, one of the things that was interesting about that from our perspective as astrologers is we went into last month. Sometimes we have a tension about like whether to say, oh, it's going to be a really difficult month or there's a lot of really tough stuff happening. But last month, like we didn't really have that attention. We pretty much agreed unanimously that last month looked like it was really tough due to all of the Pluto aspects. And we were pretty blunt about that, I think, in the last forecast, right? Yeah, I don't remember. I remember trying to be polite about it, but not, um, uh, <laughs> uh, not, not, uh, what is the, yeah, not gilding the lily because it was, you know, it was, um, it was astrologically speaking, it's, it was, um, the classical situation where you have not one, but multiple, uh, multiple planets or points that all signify difficulty in and of themselves all aligned with each other in the case of Mars and the South node conjunct, and then, um, square that Pluto. And so it's just a lot all um a lot of difficulty and we can just say negativity uh, be an understatement um all focused yeah. around a very uh, a very small time frame which yeah, is and especially what 2020 looked like too right which is actually interesting because we had the same thing but we learned so much in 2020 about like not sometimes like when you see really difficult stuff coming up to say that and not to pull punches like too much and that ended up kind of coming in handy last month where we one of the things we focused on was the Mars Pluto square which was going exact around the 7th and 8th and 9th of October and then that ended up coinciding very well with the attacks which started on that opened everything on October 7th um then there was the Pluto station in Capricorn that happened on October 10th 
Then Mars went into Scorpio on October 12th. And then finally, we had a major solar eclipse in Libra on October 14th, um, which put us in eclipse season. And then we've just been in the middle of that eclipse and the upcoming difficult eclipse uh, in Taurus at the end of this month, at the end of October, um, where everyone's just waiting for the next stage of this to begin. But it's been really striking how well a lot of it lined up with the astrology over the past few weeks. Yeah, yeah, it has been striking. It's, um, you know, there are times, uh, there are times where you don't want the astrology to be that literal. You right. Know, there, there are times where you're excited, you got a prediction, right? But then it's like, oh, no, like that was that was much, you know, when you provide a metaphor sometimes, or, you know, an image or a way of thinking about something. Um, and there's a much, uh, and, and you get a very literal version of that rather than the preferred metaphorical. Yeah. And I mean, the main thing is just that there's been an enormous amount of like suffering and civilian casualties, um, over the past several weeks and just the images coming out of, of all of this conflict right now have been really devastating of just seeing like like children dying on both sides and being murdered and um some of the most extreme manifestations of some of those placements which you know interestingly it's like we tried to interpret archetypally and in some instances actually did a really good job of um one of the things i was really interested in was last month i used an analogy of being careful of issues where force are used and somebody reacting to something and then using too much force, like an excessive amount of force so that you like hurt or kill something. And I use the analogy of like Lenny from, you know, Steinbeck's of mice and men um, in that forecast a month ago. And then it was interesting hearing what happened with there was the attacks on Israel and then Israel's response, but so much of their response sounded like um, so much of the terminology that was being used or the phrases was very much keyed in with like that Mars Pluto stuff of using like overwhelming force. And um, I, I, I wrote down some quotes, like as the news stories were coming out, just about some of the quotes that were being used. And one of the quotes was um, quote unquote, mighty vengeance. Another one said, to turn that the, they were going to turn whoever the Hamas into ruins. Another said that it said, quote, they were going to use an overwhelming show of force. And another said they were going to fight back on a scale and intensity that the enemy has so far not experienced. And another quote said overwhelming retribution. And so much of that was just very reminiscent in not very good ways of of many of those underlying the darker sides of some of those archetypes that we were talking about last month with those configurations yeah with uh, absolutely and with mars pluto you get like the language of annihilation right mars may alone may use the language of triumph or victory right but it was is the the language of annihilation was you know uh the air was was thick with it Right, for sure. And um, just another note about that. I, I don't, I, this is not something I mentioned in the, the podcast last time, but um, the with Mars K2 or Mars, Mars in the South Node combined um, under certain conditions, um, that combination, uh, I was taught that that combination, this is from the, the Vedic uh, training that I've done, that combination can indicate that a person is possessed by a, um, the spirit of rage or a wrathful spirit. Um, and that can be interpreted either psychologically or metaphorically um, or, or literally. But the, um, the concern with that combination under certain circumstances is that the entity or person will act as if possessed by rage um, and that they will lose themselves. They will seem like they're someone else for a period of time. And this um, possession by rage, I, I think, is something that we've seen a lot um, over the last several weeks. And that was connected with which configuration again? Uh, with M Mars K2 conjunctions. Hmm. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, I. it makes me think of, we've done so much research and I keep seeing Pluto configurations also tied in with that and with the founding charts of 
different um, players of of Israel, of Hamas, of like Benjamin Netanyahu. All of those have Mars Pluto either conjunct closely or co present in the same sign, and and it also makes me think of that just because that's part of then what the trigger was here in this instance. So um, let's talk about some of that astrology, though. I meant to preface this part of the discussion by saying, you know, as, as astrologers, we try to make sense of things through the lens of astrology, and that's what we're going to try to do here today. Um, but obviously, you know, I'm not an expert on geopolitics in the Middle East, but I think like many people, I've been learning a lot lately, and we'll try to share some of the observations that I've had as an astrologer. Um, but our goal isn't really to rec recapitulate all of the news and information and talking point and, and discussions that have been happening over the past few weeks, but rather to talk about specific points where we've noticed a really compelling astrological correlation that provides some insight into the situation. Um, so our goal here is to try to continue to serve that dual function that the forecast episodes always have, which is on the one hand, recording and documenting how the astrology played out over the past month since our last forecast as part of adding to the research of the astrological tradition, but then also looking ahead at the month um, ahead in the second part of the episode. So one of the things I know a lot of astrologers were um, focused on and were researching and were very interested in is this is a unique situation from an astrological standpoint because we actually have a pretty solid um, birth chart for Israel um, because it was founded so recently, because it's not a country that's like hundreds of years old before, you know, video and audio recording and everything else, that there's actually pretty good documentation of it. Um, so this is the chart that most people use for Israel. Um, and it has 23 degrees of Libra rising. It's set for May 14th, 1948 at 4 p.m. in Tel Aviv, Israel. And this was for the start of the meeting when the gavel was first pounded to open the meeting by the first prime minister that basically led to the creation of Israel. So this chart has 23 Libra rising. Um, and one of the things, it has the midheaven at 25 degrees of cancer. And the thing that everybody immediately noticed when everything started happening this month is that Mars, I think on the day of the attacks, was at 25 degrees of Libra. So it had just passed over the ascendant of Israel. It was squaring the midheaven and also transiting Pluto, which was just stationing there at 27, 28 Capricorn, was directly on the IC and opposing the midheaven. So there was like a very strong signature there right away. And then after that, immediately we had the first in a series of eclipses that will take place over the next year and a half, we had the first eclipse in the sign of Libra, which ended up being very close to and pretty much right on top of that ascendant for this chart. So it brought in the, the eclipse component because it meant the eclipse was taking place right on the ascendant of the chart for the foundation of Israel as a state. Yeah. And yeah, it's worth noting that that, <clears throat> that the moon at the time of the attack was applying to a square with that Mars conjunct the south node and square Pluto, which we'd um we'd identified as that was the most that was the most dangerous part of an of a quite unsteady month. And you know, the moon's application or come uh forming an aspect with a planet, especially a harsh aspect like a, a harder aspect like a square, is what brings these things about. It it brings something that's ready to happen. Uh, into being which uh it did tragically so yeah that happened three times this month um twice in very negative ways and, and a third in a positive way that the moon acted as a trigger for a pre-existing like configuration so here we're looking at the chart for when the hamas attack began around 6 30 a.m on october 7th 2023 and what was interesting is like libra was rising and we see that mars right there at 26 degrees of libra and we see the south node there at 24 libra um, but as you're pointing out the moon was at 20 degrees of uh, cancer and it's applying to that square with mars and then the opposition with pluto which is is activating and acting as a as a sort of trigger um, yeah so yeah so other th other things that were going on additionally is um, Venus was at 20 degrees of Leo, which is really interesting. One, because that was the shadow degree where Venus retrograded at like 29, 28 Leo over the summer. So Venus was just finally returning to the degree it went retrograde at earlier this summer. And 28 Leo keeps showing up as a sensitive point um, in 
this whole thing because that's actually the the degree of Mars in the Israel chart is 28 degrees of Leo. So there's lots of interesting connections there. Um, yeah, so this is the chart of the attack. Did you have anything else with this? Oh, I mean, with this chart, I mean, there's, you know, we, we both went down research rabbit holes. Yeah. Um, I could say, uh, say a little bit uh, about the, um, the south node being in Libra and this being the first eclipse in Libra in this cycle. Mm -hmm. So this, um, <clears throat> uh, the eclipses in Libra and Aries with the south node in Libra, um, every, which occur, you know, roughly every 19 years, um, have every single time in the history of Israel since its founding, um, <clears throat> shown, um, violent dispute, uh, over borders the very the first time was actually when um the the borders uh the borders were territorial extent was agreed upon with the uh, with the surrounding arab states uh, this was known as the the green line or the pre-1967 borders and then of course what's 1967 it's the first time the nodes uh come back to south node in libra and North Node in Aries. And so the borders get changed to the 1967 borders, which is a result of the War of Attrition following the Six Days War. Um, and then I won't walk, uh, I won't walk everyone through every one of these, um, <clears throat> but every every iteration since, right? So it's late 60s, late 80s, um, middle of the aughts, and then now um you get <clears throat> Um, you get these borders um, get uh, get stu scuffed or overstepped, um, and there is um, there's quite a bit of violence for an extended period of time um, over those borders. And it was really shocking to see that um, the first agreement around borders was during was during this this uh, the period of these eclipses, and then they changed the next time, and they're just always up for dispute. And so what's yeah. interesting, what, one more point about this, um, and then like to hand off, is that Israel is born in the eclipse cycle right before this with the north node in Taurus and the south node in Scorpio. And the sun is with the uh, the, the north node. So Israel is born right, uh, right after an eclipse. And so the Israel has its nodal return. And then the next phase is always this Libra Aries, which is, of course, the first and seventh house, right, for, for the nation, right, which is um, self and other for a person. Um, it's very me and you, me versus you, me with you, whatever that dynamic is. Um, and so that's what it's looked like historically. Unfortunately, it also looks like that now. Yeah, the um, you know, the occurrence of all this this month and the close coinciding with that eclipse in Libra that was so obvious sent me on a whole research path over the past few weeks trying to study when eclipses have coincided with past important moments of history, because it became really clear that this was one of those. And I wanted to try to understand it better by going back and looking at the, looking at the context of other major events. And I found just Nick Dagan Vest and I did a whole episode I just released where we found just so many important turning points in history when an eclipse would happen within just a few days of a really important historical moment. And one of them was, as you just said, the founding of Israel itself happened on May 14th, 1948. And this was just like five days after a solar eclipse in the sign of Taurus. Um, and then, of course, we're getting ready to have another eclipse in Taurus here at the end of October, um, which is one of the things we'll talk about here in a moment. Um, but also, interestingly, um, Benjamin Netanyahu, the current prime minister of Israel and the guy that's kind of in charge of a lot of this right now, he was actually born within 24 hours of a solar eclipse in the sign of Libra on October 21st, 1949. His sun is at about 27 degrees of Libra and his moon is at about 19 degrees of Libra. And the node is the south node is right there at 16 Libra. Um, so basically hours after he was born there was a total there was a solar eclipse in that sign and so of course what we're seeing now is a repetition of an eclipse in libra happening at a really important event and turning point that he's directly involved in and and will become 
you know, probably one of the things one way or another that's going to be that he'll be known for and that his legacy will hinge on is, is the events that are happening right now. Um, and that's something we saw over and over again happening in the um, eclipses episode that, that Nick and I did last week. Yeah. Chris, could you click back to that chart for a second? Or Netanyahu? Yes, please. There we go. So, um, you know, uh, related to this is uh, questions of an eclipse, like a nodal return, right? So this was a solar eclipse. The one that we just experienced was a solar eclipse on the south node in Libra. And so that this is uh this is an this is a return uh for Netanyahu, right? And so we <clears throat> um you know uh, so uh, on a very simple level, like eclipse returns activate whatever the nodal themes in a person's life are. Some people are very nodal, they're born right after eclipses or during eclipses. And so when you have these uh these uh nodal returns and then the eclipses within those. Um, you really see uh, you see a key thread in that person's storyline. Like as you said, like how how this is handled, like the fact that all this happened and then how it is handled is absolutely going to be part of his legacy. Worth noting, he also has the same Mars as the nativity of Israel. Yeah, at 27, his his is at 26 Leo, and um the Israel's is Mars at 28, but it means that Venus and like the retrograde this summer where Venus stationed there and then eventually came back there um, right on the attacks was activating that for not just Israel, but also in his chart personally. Um, so it's also interesting, you know, he has that Mars Pluto conjunction there um, is a signature I keep seeing come up over and over again, because I was trying to research um sort of the uh, Israel side of things, but then I was also trying to research Hamas, which was the organization that launched the attack on Israel that started the October 7th part of this. And um, interestingly, if the foundation dates are roughly correct, it was founded on a Mars-Pluto conjunction in Scorpio. Um, uh, also, in, in that was December 10th of 1987. There was also a, a Saturn-Uranus conjunction in Sagittarius at the same time that was not as close, but is also present. Um, so it's interesting seeing just this repetition of some of these themes come up over and over again in different ways. Um, and even you know, looking at the Israel chart itself, there were two other placements that were interesting and curious. One of them is that very close Saturn-Pluto conjunction, because we've spent so much time talking about and thinking about Saturn-Pluto conjunctions over the past few years, because of course, that was one of the major alignments that happened in January of 2020. It went exact in January of 2020 at the emergence of COVID. And I did an episode on talking about that, but also talking about how the Saturn-Pluto conjunction in the early 1980s had coincided with the emergence of the AIDS pandemic, basically. Um, but this was one that I was never fully sort of clear about, um, was the 1948 sort of 1940s conjunctions of Saturn and Pluto, which didn't coincide with the pandemic. But it's interesting that you have it right here. And one of the big things that happened was, um, you know, the foundation of Israel and then how that just kind of bakes in that Mars, Saturn, Pluto conjunction to the chart so that you've just then subsequently for many decades had these recurring periods of just like these explosions of like violence and stuff that keep happening over and over again. Um, and it's interesting thinking about that within the context of that either double or, or triple conjunction in Leah, um, as well as I meant to say the Saturn-Pluto conjunction there. And this is 1948. So we're talking about a country that's founded in the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust and like like attempts to exterminate the Jewish people in Europe, um, and that how much that's sort of embedded in the sort of national psyche in different ways in Israel and shows up in different ways. And having that Saturn Pluto conjunction there in the birth chart seems to speak to that or be reminiscent of it. Certainly, and um, you know the Moon being in the same sign testifies to that being a very felt legacy. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not, it's not, it's there, but the moon is there too. So it's, you know, the, the moon, wherever the moon is, we can feel that, you know, it informs experience in a more, uh, in a more lived way. Um, but yeah, that the Saturn Pluto conjunctions, um, just following world war two are in a lot of national charts because we had this reorganization of the world order 
after World War II. And when you look at those charts, you see that you see a lot of um, a lot of nations that have boundaries drawn. This is Leo, right? So it's like sovereign. It, it speaks particularly to so <clears throat> the boundaries of sovereignty. Um, and so you see a lot of nations where there's been a lot of criticism since about where the lines were drawn. Um, and again, that's it's you know, there are dozens uh, of nations. That's a great that point. Part of that, yeah, where it's like the boundaries themselves are always going to be problems. So Saturn is always just classically boundaries, and Pluto being like conflict over that, or or tensions, or or extremism, or other things like that. Yeah, just like we saw in 2020, the um, you know the boundedness of that and the um, widespread discomfort with the boundaries, right? The um, uh, <clears throat> the go-to sort of image or feeling of being imprisoned. Right, for sure. Um, the only other thing I noticed in the Israel chart was just I thought it was interesting that Uranus is there at 24 Gemini because that's also the same as the United States. Um, mm -hmm. And the connection between those two in some ways, but also that that means starting in 2025, just like the United States, the US and Israel are both going to start their Uranus return here just in a couple of years. And for the US, I know that's always coincided with a period of conflict because of it's being configured to the US's Mars, which is in the same sign in Gemini, so that we've had like in the US, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War and World War II under those Uranus returns in Gemini. Um, and you know, whatever that's indicating coming up for Israel in terms of some sort of major shift there, but it's with respect to like the ninth house and like like different countries. Um, and I don't know if that relates then to the US or 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 what. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I hadn't thought of uh um the United States and Israel having the same Uranus position. Um, and then also the same Venus, which is the ruler of the ascendant in that Israel chart. Right, in Cancer. That's and a good what's, point. what's interesting is, um, I don't know, um, for as long as I've paid attention, maybe the last 20 some years, I always thought of the US and Israel as being always being close allies. And you could see the sinistry in the chart. Um, but that wasn't actually the case for the first several decades uh, of Israel's uh, existence. Um, but with the with that sinistry, it's, um, it's not surprising that that came to be the case. Right. Um, all right. So other things I was looking back through eclipse history and the eclipse episodes I mentioned, because I was also trying to research like peace and um, what the different periods in the past were historically where that was more or less possible or or the possibility of peace became almost something that, that seemed achievable at the time. And there were different periods. But one of the big ones that came up that's related to now was 30 years ago they were in the process of doing like the Oslo Accords um, where the Israelis and the Palestinians like started trying to strike some historical agreements um, to try to, to work some things out or at least move in that direction. Um, and some of that happened during Saturn and Aquarius. Uh, but then it was interesting that the they were given a, a peace prize for signing the first Oslo Accords. And that peace prize was given October 14th of 1994. Um, and that was when um, Saturn was in Pisces actually at the time. Saturn was in early Pisces, just like it is now. But what ended up happening is about like a year later, um, the prime minister of Israel who was involved in the peace process with the Palestinians um, was assassinated by a right-wing Israeli militant um, who didn't like the, the sort of concessions that were being made and other things, I guess. Um, and so that happened right at the same time as an eclipse. So that was like one of the examples we used of like the the death of a world leader that coincided with an eclipse at that time, but then um, it ended up having a disruptive process on the the whole peace process with Saturn and Pisces going through at that time. And I know I read that like Bill Clinton, for example, at the time called Yitzhak Rabin the prime minister who was assassinated. He referred to him as a martyr for peace um, at the time, which just made me think of that Saturn transit through. Uh, Pisces at the time, and that may be being relevant or being symbolically significant in some way. Yeah, that's interesting. Can you go back to that chart for just a second, Chris? 
for the um, Nobel Peace Prize? Yes. Yeah, here you go. Right. So what's interesting is we have um, not a nodal return, but we have the nodal opposition for Israel there, where the nodes are actually in the same degree as when Israel was founded, but um, flipped. So we have north on south and south on north. And then, you know, the nodal oppositions are different than any other opposition because in the sky, it just looks like eclipses in exactly the same place as when the person or nation was born. But the the dragon is facing the opposite way. And so it's that it's that other really strong activation uh, of the eclipse axis in the, yeah. in the natal well, chart. So it's well, like same but opposite. Well, then tied in with that, look at what's happening on that node is venus and jupiter exactly conjoining and what's crazy about this i almost missed it at first but venus had just stationed retrograde a day earlier at 17 degrees of scorpio so it slowed down and stopped at 17 so what happens if you animate the chart and move it forward is jupiter actually overtakes venus over like within a day or two of this chart so they won the nobel peace prize or were awarded the nobel peace prize for the oslo accords basically right as venus and jupiter were conjoining and venus was stationing retrograde all conjunct the north node oh yeah and that's ruled by mars in leo which is right on israel's natal moon and getting ready to go over the rest of the planets in leo yeah that, that was Mar mars is like squaring mercury too which is not great yeah. and of course you know the eventual outcome of that you know, a year later was um, the prime minister being um, assassinated partially as a result of that. And then um, some of the things getting messed up subsequently over the next decade and continuing to devolve, which actually ties us into the the eclipse in the same series 19 years ago that preceded this, as it was really important, is um, that this eclipse just took place in Libra and eclipses repeat in the same place every 19 years. So if you go back 19 years, you end up in October of 2004. And what was happening then is a, an eclipse in Libra took place and the Israelis moved into northern Gaza and occupied northern Gaza at that time, which is a really striking um, correlation then because that's kind of a repetition of what everyone's expecting right now and in some ways what's already been happening over the past few weeks with the bombing of northern gaza and with them telling everybody in northern gaza that they have to leave and move south um so we're seeing a repetition there of, of very similar themes yeah yeah unfortunately yeah so the only thing other thing that was relevant there that might be relevant here today in terms of repetitions um is that on October 11th, 2004, around the time of that eclipse in Libra, um, then Prime Minister uh, of Israel, Ariel Sharon, outlined his plan to start legislation for a disengagement from Gaza, um, and he presented that to like the Israeli Congress. And later that month, around the Taurus eclipse, the Israeli Congress gave its preliminary approval of that plan, and part of the plan was to start removing settlements from Gaza at that time, which then they actually did and dismantled a bunch of the the settlements in Gaza um, that existed for a few decades up to that point in 2005, in the summer of 2005. So that's the only thing that I'm a little hopeful for is there's different not good reasons for why they did that, but um, hopefully that there could be some positive things that come out of all of this, if indeed that sort of disengagement from Gaza last time was part of what resulted from this eclipse series 19 years ago. Yeah, I um in my research all I've seen is patterns that I hope are not consistent. Um because with with again with this this installment of the eclipse cycle which has just begun for us which is going to last about another year and a half um in every in every installment of this in Israel's history, it's gotten ugly and then it's stayed ugly for years. Um, the only one that was only the first one where the green line was established that didn't see immediate um, or the, the continuation of violence for several years. Every other one has had sparks that have continued to burn for several years. And so um, 
I hope that that is not the case. Right? Things, um, you know, these these astrological patterns are shockingly consistent, but they're not. It's not every single time. Right? Things do have to change at some point, um, but up to this point, uh, all I'm seeing with this this particular eclipse cycle is something that I hope we don't do again. Yeah, I do think something is different about this time, and there's something different about this eclipse happening in the on the ascendant of the Israel chart, where it seems like um, I feel like in previous decades where there's been incursions into Gaza by the Israelis, it was like before the advent of like smartphones and social media, and I think on both sides this time the extent and vividness of the carnage and the civilian casualties is much more clear uh, to everyone than it has been in previous decades. Um, and there's something about that that I feel like is almost changing the nature of the dialogue and of of the potential for whatever is going to come out of this because um, it's not like previous decades where it was just like a brief snippet in a news report as far as people we're concerned or things like that, that there's something more in your face about it uh, and th than at other times, in addition to just the scale and the scope of the of the, the carnage and the civilian casualties. Yeah, that's a hopeful point. And I suppose that this is the first time that this repetition has happened since we moved into a different historical era, right? From the, the triplicity perspective, we we just got done with 200 years of Jupiter, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and Earth signs. We're now in the 200 years of air. And, you know, these elemental eras have different rules, right? The Earth is not the same as air historically, not the same as fire. And so, you know, maybe, maybe this, yeah, maybe, maybe it will be, maybe there's uh, a reason to be hopeful for an exception to the established pattern. Sure. But certainly in the short term, um, there's a lot of really difficult astrology coming up in the next month um, that we're not trying to sugarcoat at all. I mean, even just the Saturn station that the month is about to open with, um, even eclipse aside, it's stationing at zero degrees of Pisces, which is opposite within three degrees the that Mars um, in the Israel chart at 28 degrees of Leo. So it's like, you know, that sounds very similar to what we are gearing up for, which is if they do a ground war incursion into Gaza and just like a huge, even larger amount of casualties on both sides um, in, a, in a long sort of protracted thing, um, that sounds reminiscent of that with Saturn stationing opposite that Mars. Yeah, that, um, that, that certainly suggests that. And then um, Mars being in Scorpio now and um, through uh, through nearly the or through most of November and making a very important conjunction with the Sun. Um, you know, Mars is not only strong in Scorpio, um, but it's the fixed sign that it rules and it describes, you know, as we described, not thinking about this last month, but um, thinking about it as an influence. It's um, Mars and Scorpio is fierce and determined. It's power. Part of its power is that it doesn't give up, even if it would be better for everyone if it did, or you would prefer there not be so much tenacity. So yeah, I think if we are going to place our hopes, we we won't be placing them in. Uh, we won't be placing our hopes for peace in November. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to, let's see, any other notes? The only other major notes I had was just continuing the eclipse theme. I noticed that I believe the the current leader of Hamas was born within four days of an eclipse, and the previous leader of Hamas before him, who's also in the news recently, was also born within a week of an eclipse, and that leader took over at one point when the two previous founders of Hamas were killed in an Israeli airstrike, which also occurred on an eclipse. So they're just there's just like eclipse stuff like all throughout this with all of the major players on both sides, and it's happening during eclipses. So it's just it's been a stunning, um, illustrative at least for an, from an astrological and a sort of abstract intellectual standpoint lesson about eclipses and um, how they can both coincide with the the birth of people. And then when they do, that sometimes then those eclipses become even more important in their subsequent chronologies. 
Yeah, right. It's um, it's the it, it's it, it's that I don't know what you call it. Um, it's that thing with astrology where, um, you know, we're all affected by all of the planets, but um, usually if you filter out a biography, if you filter out history, um, nations and people. Um, tend to have one or two planets or cycles that really show you the best, the worst, that like give you the like the landmarks of the biography. Um, you know, we've been uh, over the last couple of years, we've been talking about Russian chronology and the Saturn Neptune conjunction. We can talk about Russian history and, or excuse me, uh, American history and Uranus and Gemini, right? And we we see with Russia and with Israel, um, we have leaders that have the like the, Vladimir Putin has the Saturn Neptune just like Russia because of course he does. Um, you have Netanyahu who has the uh, the solar eclipse um, just like the one uh, Israel was born right after. Um, and you know Nick, your your our friend Nick Dagan Best, um, who you did the eclipse episode with, um, you know has done a stunning job of finding the people for whom Venus. Uh, particular venus retrograde cycles tell their story um and so yeah if you can find the the cycle that and this this works on a natal level right as well as a global power politics um level for sure and that was actually two we didn't include in the episode but that um russia the the fall of the soviet union and the establishment of the new russian state in december of 1991 happened within days of, a, of an eclipse and then Vladimir Putin um, became the um, acting prime minister of Russia in August of 1999, which is within two days of an eclipse. So, um, yeah, just, you know, prominent, powerful people, major turning points in world history, like eclipses act as triggers. They're not the only thing like we saw with COVID, for example, where eclipses happened at the beginning of of. 2020 in, in December of 2019 and January of 2020, there's always background things that are happening, like the Saturn Pluto conjunction that was happening then. But these eclipses can really act as triggers, as flashpoints, and as points where where everything just suddenly becomes more prominent and the speed of events starts moving very quickly. Yeah. One of the ways um that I, I teach nodes with students is that um, so is that you've got you've got the nodes, right? Which are somewhere always. And, and within a given eclipse cycle, you have, um, uh, you have, for example, the, uh, the North node being in Aries and the South node being in Libra for about 18 months. Um, and that part of the nature of the nodes is they describe what is hidden, obscured, or in psychological language, latent. Um, it's there, but it's beneath the surface. You can't see it or feel it. Um, but the eclipses give what is invisible or latent a moment to rise to the surface and change everything at once. And so it's almost like um, I find it useful to think of the nodes, the transiting nodes, as like storing up power and changing, getting ready for big shifts to occur. Um, but they need the the moments of the eclipses. They need eclipse season to come up to the surface and actually change um, change what things look like. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, okay, and in a less horrible way, we also see like important changes in perspectives in natal charts. We're like, oh, it all came together. Like, I'm actually done with this, or I'm actually ready to do this. Right when they emerged, uh, when they come to the surface in an individual's life, it's not always uh, assassinations and regime change and um, transitions of power. Yeah, that's true. Um, and that's, yeah, it's actually something I want to transition to is talking more about that in eclipses here in a minute. Um, to wrap up this section, we mentioned that there were, the moon keeps triggering other configurations here this month over the past month. So um, we've already talked about how the, the beginning of the Hamas attack itself um, was the moon swooping in and triggering the Mars-Pluto square. Um, but then also um, the bombing of a hospital that occurred on October 17th, the moon was at 28 degrees of Scorpio, and it was actually applying, again, within two degrees to a square with Saturn, which was at zero degrees of Pisces. So it was like activating that um, placement. 
And then there was one other that was, or that fell on the same day that was more positive and was one of the few like glimmers of hope during all of this. Um, and one of them was that um, Hamas released two American hostages on October 20th in the evening, probably somewhere around 9.30 p.m., give or take. Um, actually, this it was actually a little later than this, but the main point is that um, this is the part of the month, remember, where we talked about in our last forecast that one of the most positive aspects of the month was this Venus-Jupiter trine, where Venus got up to 10, 11, and 12 degrees of Virgo, and it trined Jupiter at 12 degrees of Taurus. And so one positive event that happened is the moon came in in Capricorn. It completed a grand trine with Venus and Jupiter, um, and two hostages were released out of, I guess, somewhere around 200 that are still being held that were um, taken during the original attack uh, on October 7th. Um, but then also one of the things that happened is that Israel had been cutting off food and water and fuel to Gaza for the past two weeks, um, which was creating this huge and has created a, an enormous humanitarian crisis. Um, and I think the US and, and some uh, lots of people were protesting and trying to put pressure on Israel to allow humanitarian aid trucks into the country for simple things like food and water. And then eventually, um, the first aid trucks were allowed into Gaza on October 21st, around 1030 in the morning, give or take. And this was also right on the Venus Jupiter trine, which was being completed and triggered by the moon trining Venus and Jupiter and creating a grand trine. So it was a good example. And even though this is still paltry in comparison, it was only like 20 aid trucks, whereas they need something like a thousand trucks in order to support um, the basic like calorie needs of of the people in Gaza in terms of food and stuff that needs to be imported. So it's not actually fixing everything, but it was at least a glimmer of hope that sometimes when these positive aspects do occur, even in the admits in the midst of other terrible stuff that's happening, that sometimes there can be little bits of relief or little positive things or little attempts at at peace or or what have you. Yeah, it's something. Right, right, yeah, where there can be very yeah, in a situation where there can very easily be nothing. And, right, you know, yeah, yeah. So I thought that was something and something important to keep in mind. So that when we look at a lot of the difficult aspects that are coming up in November over the next several weeks, we'll try to also point out some of the occasional times where there's a, a glimmer of some positive stuff going on. That could be a positive counterbalancing thing, or it could be helping at least a little bit. Yeah, I mean, if we on a lived level, right there, you can, we can probably all think of um, hard periods in life where it sucked for a year, or it sucked for three months, or it sucked for three years. Um, but the bright moments in that, even though they don't change the overall arc, um, are irreplaceable. Right? They they give you you know, just the, a, a good day in the middle of a bad week, right? Or even a good day in the middle of a, of a rough month um, is not, not without meaning. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, so it looks like we're at about 50 minutes. So I want to transition and do just a couple other news topics before we move on to the forecast. Okay. Let's do it. All right. So um, the only other actually really major well, actually, one I did want to mention briefly, even though I don't have a lot to say about it astrologically, but it was it seemed crucial because of the weird coinciding. But there were some major earthquakes in Afghanistan, a uh, cluster of four of them this month. And the first two were actually on October 7th, which was the same day as the, um, the attack on Israel with the Mars-Pluto square, which is really striking. And then the next two were on October 11th and 15th really um, clustered around the October 14th solar eclipse in Libra. Um, so that was actually a huge thing where the World Health Organization estimated there was um, 1,400 fatalities, 2,000 injuries, and 43,000 people affected, um, and 100,000 requiring humanitarian aid. Um, so it was just weird the coinciding of that with some of the astrology and the other world events that were taking place at the same time under some of those difficult alignments. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is 
Um, there was a thing I saw originally on TikTok a few weeks ago. It was happening at the beginning of October where there's a person um, in Pennsylvania where the police came and visited their metaphysical store. They have an occult store in Pennsylvania um, and the owner of the store, their name is Beck Lawrence, um, who just turned 26 and owns a store title that's called The Serpent's Key Shop and Sanctuary, a metaphysical store in Hanover, Pennsylvania, and got like profiled in a local newspaper that was talking about like lo local businesses, and it gave them a positive write-up. And um, the apparently the local like police chief saw this profile and then went in and visited them and told them that um, there are anti-fortune telling laws that are still on the books in Pennsylvania and almost seemed to kind of like, I don't know if it was supposed to be a threat or if it was supposed to be a warning or what it was exactly, but um, it created this kind of um, on social media and even eventually the New York Times published it in an article titled, A Pennsylvania Shop Offered Tarot Readings, Then the Police Came. And it just sort of highlighted that in many places, there's still these archaic laws on the books that are anti-astrology laws or other types of anti-fortune telling laws that are latent and sometimes not being enforced. But it reminded me that even as recently as 20 years ago, with all those laws on the books, that sometimes the police would like raid metaphysical bookstores. And I heard stories of stores being raided in Denver just like 20 years ago, and they would arrest like astrologers or, or other readers for some of these archaic laws. And what happened at the time is that there were organizations set up like the Association for Astrological Networking that had lawyers that would fight these laws, and they would always win them on the First Amendment grounds, on the right to freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Um, but it's interesting, you know, we've been talking about over the past few years with the Saturn and Pisces and the upcoming Saturn-Neptune conjunction, that one of the things that comes up with that sometimes is like skepticism or the potential for pushback against astrology. And with Saturn stationing in Pisces here in the next few weeks, it just really reminded me of that. And I worry it could be like an echo of things to come potentially and the need for astrologers to think in terms of that and sort of organize properly to, to fight things like that if necessary. Yeah, yeah, that's um that's a real thing and it's both, you know, we we see both as you said, uh, Neptune Saturn with Saturn coming to uh limit or constrain or potentially condemn net, you know, whatever Neptune's been doing in Pisces. And so not only do we have that like the energy of that pending conjunction, but we also have that marking the end of Neptune's time in Pisces. And Neptune, Neptune went into Pisces a little bit in 2011, and then strode in in 2012. Um, and there've been a there've been a huge number of cultural changes since then. One of them is that astrology is so much more popular. You know, you and I were both there um, for it, Chris, and we were very confused for many years because um, <laughs> we we had uh, uh, you know we we'd sort of um, uh, said, uh, you know, we we did we decided to be astrologers in a very different circumstance. Um, you know, and astrology got I don't know five times as popular. It seemed like starting maybe 2018, 2019, a whole generation and a half poured in. Do you remember the quaint discussions that we had um, about like, oh, where are the young people? Right. right? <laughs> which is which are literally absurd now, but we're a very real concern, um, you know, even even in 2012. Um, and so, you know, we know that Neptune's leaving Pisces. We know that Saturn and Neptune are getting closer and closer. Um, and so I, um, you know, you and I have been talking about this. I've been thinking about this for years because whenever you have, you know, a flood, like floods don't last, right? Or high tide never lasts. And so what does it, what does it look like when the tide goes out, right? And you mentioned um, pushback on astrology from skeptics. We also um, historically have pushback on astrology from, uh, from religious organizations, right? Right. And so, you know, astrology, the, you know, one of the things that astrology has managed to survive and will manage to survive is that astrology gets it from both sides 
you know, the, the secular humanists um, think that we're uh, lying to ourselves and people um, and the, um, the fundamentalist religious people think that what we're doing is real, but clearly, um, you know, uh, clearly uh, uh, verboten um, and possibly empowered by the devil or other powers. And so yeah. I was just you know, thinking about that in the eclipses episode, because it's in the Bible, Jesus is not only born under uh, an astrologically uh, auspicious alignment of of some un some unspecified alignment where th like a group of astrologers actually goes and follows it to see his birth supposedly in the gospel of matthew but he then dies if you read the bible under an eclipse um which makes it actually one of the most famous eclipse stories wow is, is that jesus actually it says pretty clearly like died under an eclipse in the middle of a day which is again another astrological correlation that ties it in with not only the older mesopotamian astrological tradition which may have started i discovered due to a series of three kings that may have died under eclipses uh like 2000 bce 3000 bce but it even makes it in line with like the contemporary tradition where nick and i pointed out that the three um kings who died in the uk in the 20th century all died around eclipses um so it's interesting thinking about that and the religious pushback that astrology gets from christians sometimes when like astrology is literally focal point in like the the biography of jesus yeah well we we actually had something along this theme happen last month um here around the the Kapakia. um kate had uh in uh <clears throat> in concert with the release of her thema mundi series kate had contracted with a local bakery um to create these super cool um basically world were a uh, globe shaped cookies with the the primordial continent of pangea and this this bakery which i won't name now that I think about it, um, uh, you know, that Kate, uh, it was a very large order uh, of, uh, uh, of, of treats. And then they emailed Kate shortly before the launch. Um, and the owner said basically, oh, I read your website. And I have very, as a Christian, as in trying to live a Jesus centered life, um, a Christ centered life. Um, you know, I have very strong boundaries around witchcraft and astrology, and I can't work with you. Um, and so Kate's super resourceful, and she managed to scramble and get it done, come up with an alternative anyway. Um, but like that, you know, that was a <laughs> that wasn't a legal precedent. But if we're looking at like pushback against astrology, um, that was something that happened to us very recently. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, it's not well, amazing, but uh, I mean, it's a, it's a great example, but it was, a, we were, and yeah. we were both like, oh yeah, Saturn, Neptune, right? Like we're, you know, bumping into one of the boundaries. And of yeah. course there are, you know, there are fortune telling books, uh, fortune telling laws on the books here that aren't enforced. Um, okay. but that that's kind of, that that's the worrying point, right? It's not like, uh, like how, um, you know, how easy or hard is it for um for there to be pushed back legally speaking and the laws are still on the books they're just not enforced it's much easier to just start enforcing an existing law than to go through the whole legislative process of creating new anti-astrology laws right and what um lisa scheim wrote just now who was former presiding officer of afan is that afan the association for astrological networking took a case I think in the 90s, all the way to the California Supreme Court and won an anti-astrology case, but presumed current safety is based on the honoring of legal precedent and interpretations of the First Amendment and the current U.S. Supreme Court since adding the last few members has not always been honoring legal precedent anymore. So it's like astrologers can't, we can't always like rest on our laurels. So that's one of the reasons I want to mention this. Um, AFAN, I believe this year, was recently merged with OPA, the Organization for Professional Astrology. So you can now find out more information at opaastrology.org. And hopefully, if this becomes an issue that astrologers need to deal with again, that OPA would be able to step up um, with AFAN now being part of it to deal with some of this stuff. And I'll be paying close attention to what happens with this case with um, Beck Lawrence, who is the name is the name of the person that runs the occult store in, in 
Pennsylvania, and you can find them at The Stitching Witch on TikTok. Um, if you Google that, they mentioned recently their sun is in Virgo, moon is in Taurus, and ascendant is in Scorpio. So that means this Taurus eclipse that's about to happen later this month is in their 10th whole sign house. So it'll be interesting to see how, how things play out. Yeah, yeah. And just one point to make, um, you know, there are so many people who've jumped into astrology uh, in the last five years, and astrology is wonderful. Um, and it's just something to think about if you're continuing in astrology, something I think about a lot, is think about how you represent astrology, because when astrology is represented poorly, which it always has tons of people who represent it extremely poorly, that's not um, going to that's not going to ever end, but um, you know, you invite criticism, and unlike the last couple years, um, astrology's um, uh, astrology as a thing you can do in the open. That's a fragile state, which is not true consistently here in the West. Um, like astrology, you know, inviting astrology to be targeted. Um, is bad for astrology and it makes it harder for the astrologers. It's, um, you know, it, 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 it's important to not take for granted just being able to talk about astrology, do astrology readings. Like that's, that's not a given. Um, right. It hasn't been historically. No. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't want to, and I'm not forecasting like a sort of, um, you know, a pogrom of astrologers, but there, there will be more pushback. You know, we've been in this, this um, very temporary state of zero pushback slash surprising acceptance. And that's probably not going to be the case for the rest of my life <laughs> or yours. Yes. Yeah. Well, and that's a good point though, that therefore it's important for astrologers to present things as well as they can to present, to, to behave as ethically as you can and to um, act in the public in a way that represents all of us well, because if you don't, then conversely, it reflects badly on all of us. And, you know, unfortunately, the flip side of the coin with some of those laws is that there are scammers out there. And there are sometimes people that aren't, I don't think real astrologers, but that will try to come in and use astrology to like grift people. I have that issue constantly with Instagram where people will make fake profiles and then reach out to people with my fake astrology podcast profile and say, and try to get, offer them a reading or a fake reading or something like that so that scammers do exist. It's something therefore it's important for astrologers to recognize and call out when it happens. There is an ambiguity, of course, of what's the line sometimes between like a legitimate astrologer versus somebody that's not acting legitimately or in good faith that it, that can sometimes be blurry, but nonetheless, you know, those are some of the issues that were happening back in the nineties in the astrological community when they created some of the ethical codes in the different organizations and stuff. And that's part of the reason why. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I'm on my fourth or fifth Instagram doppelganger. Nice. Do they call people? What's the phrase? Do they say hello, oh. beloved? Oh, oh it's love, so good. I, so, um, pro I would tip. love to get a message from you that says hello, beloved. Oh, beloved. um, yeah, it, it starts like that and it always ends with blessed be. Um, yes. and then there's nice. tons of emojis. So, um, I don't use emojis. Um, I do not, uh, <laughs> I do not end uh, my messages to people with blessed be. Um, and, um, I am not cold calling people hoping to sell readings right. um little little pat <laughs> i was gonna say past that in my career at this, this point but my career is, i've never <laughs> randomly messaged people on the internet being like oh my god i need you to let me give you a reading um which you know a lot of people are like boy this um this doesn't sound like you austin um so <laughs> yeah just, just in case you know you're uh in a confused state of mind you think it might be me it, it is not if you look for the emojis look for the really positive language. That's how you'll know it's not me. Right. Yeah. If they, on the other hand, you get a message that's like telling you that you're doomed next month, then that might be you. Like you'd actually can't tell. It could go either yeah, way. Yeah. I see, I see a, a, a shadow falling across your life. I see. Right. Um, I see something monstrous arising within it. Exactly. All right. I like that. Um, Okay. On that note, um, I think that might be a good concluding remark for our news section. All right. I want to give a shout out to our sponsor for this episode, which is the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs and Calendars. 
Your Honeycomb Almanac or calendar helps you to keep track of both mundane and natal astrology for the year ahead. It is fully customized to your natal chart, preferred house system, and local time zone. Open your Honeycomb to any day of the year and you'll see the mundane transits perfecting that day plus the unique natal transits affecting your charts specifically. Your Honeycomb includes a 12-month ephemeris and overview tables for lunations and planetary stations in the coming year. The latest version also lists shadow periods for Mercury, Venus, and Mars retrogrades. In addition, you can select extra features for your Honeycomb, like the Hellenistic plugin, which highlights the transits of your annual perfected Time Lord, tracks your zodiac releasing periods, and assesses your natal and solar return charts for the traditional planetary conditions. Honeycomb offers free shipping in the continental United States and affordable international shipping, along with digital editions and gift cards. Six-month almanacs start at just $10 for a digital PDF and $27 for a printed planner, and all Honeycombs now come with a free PDF edition when you order a printed one. To receive your Honeycomb in time for the holidays, place your order by the end of November at honeycomb.co. So shout out to Honeycomb. They've been amazing, and that's one of the things, again, we didn't have when we were coming up with astrologers as astrologers, I'm very jealous, is yeah. the ability to get like personalized stuff like this you know we had to get the like ones that are non-personalized like 20 years ago yeah i had like a little i think it was a llewellyn pocket calendar for many yeah. years in a row i'd be opening that up and squinting at it exactly and trying to just like guesstimate what your transits are for that day not not the case anymore with honeycomb and with other stuff that's available these days i'm very grateful for that um and yeah shout out to them and visit their website to find out more information yeah. So, I mean, you know, younger astrologers, um, honeycomb is the reason you don't have to walk 20 miles through the snow like Chris and I did. Exactly. You can run. What is the phrase? Like they, they can run because we walked uh, up up the hill in the snow or whatever well, they, the, the phrase is. Yeah. Or they can. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm I'm just getting the image of uh, what is it? The, the Segway, the, the, the absurd little standing scooter things. Where, where we trudge through the snow, you will uh, segue by us uh, quickly in a way that right. might irritate us, but we know it's for the best. Yeah, we will we'll shake our fists at like old astrology men. All right. Let's let's transition to talking about the astrological forecast for October at this point or for November. Let's let's forget about October. Let's pretend really we can't actually now that I think about it. We yeah, can't it's really not. Of... It's really not a clean slate. No, it's not. And actually, we need to talk about that because, um, you know, we're recording this forecast a little early on October 23rd. And as a result of that, we're doing it before the final eclipse of October, which is going to take place on October 28th. So because that's part of the energy of the month and because the energy of that eclipse is going to is going to echo into early November for sure. It might be worth revisiting that eclipse and just taking it a look at it one more time to refresh ourselves on um, how not very pleasant that eclipse looks. So I'm going to pull up the animated chart and I'm going to move it to October 28th. And we see this configuration right here where the lunar eclipse or the full moon slash lunar eclipse goes exact at five degrees of Taurus opposite to the sun at five Scorpio. And right at the same time, there's a Mercury Mars conjunction that's forming with Mercury at 10 degrees of Scorpio and Mars at 11 degrees of Scorpio. And then all of that is opposite to Jupiter where Jupiter is at 11 degrees of Taurus so that there's, there's a Mars Jupiter opposition that's, that's happening simultaneously. So that's a lot to unpack, but because this is basically like the opening of the month, this is probably the thing we need to start with first. Yeah. And, you know, in, in some ways this, just before the beginning of November eclipse is the uh, is the supercharged version of a lot of the dynamics that we're going to be doing for the first part of November, right? Like we're dealing we're, we're dealing with Mercury, Mars, and the Sun all in Scorpio together, all opposing Jupiter, all opposing Uranus. And so the moon, like just like we talked about earlier, the moon comes in. Um, and makes all of that very clear and very real 
um, with the additional force of an eclipse behind it. Um, but like, these are the dynamics, right? Like it, and it's not, we're, I was gonna say not easy to summarize. We're going to try, but like that Mercury, Mars, uh, sun and Scorpio, and then opposite Uranus, Jupiter in Taurus. Yeah. So one of the things let's talk about. So one of the things I want to talk about that I didn't make clear enough last month is this is actually the last um, so the the solar eclipse that occurred two weeks ago in Libra was the first of that series in Libra that will mm. take place over the next year. It was the first one in Libra. And then this eclipse in Taurus is actually the last of an eclipse series that's been bouncing back and forth between Taurus and Scorpio for two years because the first one in this series actually started in late 2021, in like November of 2021, when we had our first lunar eclipse in Taurus. So to me, I think that means that there's something about this eclipse, which is um, the, for many people in, in terms of their personal lives, will be the winding down and the culmination of a series of events and changes that have been happening in that sector of your chart over the course of the past 20 years, or, or sorry, the past two years. And for that reason, for many people, it will be the culmination of something and the bringing to completion or the ending of that phase, rather than something that's just like completely new. Um, I think for the most part for many people, but because it's a continuation of something that's two years old now. Yeah, absolutely. This is the um, this is the last installment. Uh, this is the last episode in the series. And it's actually it's almost uh, it's almost uh, it's almost an epilogue because the nodes are done. Uh, the nodes have been done for several months now with Taurus and Scorpio, but there's just one last thing, one last thing in the Taurus Scorpio axis before we can move on. And even though an epilogue comes after, you know, the main events of a story, often it changes the meaning of the story, right? You're like, oh, so they actually ended up happy, even though we ended on this terrible note or, oh, it looked like they won. But then when we looked at the five years later, Hmm, maybe that wasn't really a victory. So it's got right. that like epilogue quality, like or after like, the end, but actually the real end. Or like they destroyed the ring in Morador, but then in the book, the scourging of the Shire. Oh, happens. yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. 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 Which doesn't change the total arc of the, you know, of the legend of the Lord of the Rings. But, you know, for the Shire inhabitants, um, not so good. Yeah. Deep cuts with the Lord of the Rings references here. Only movie watchers will not understand because they cut that out of the movie. So, um, yeah. So this Eclipse series, though, in previous ones has been interesting because one of the things that's shown up with a lot has been um, these financial crashes over the past two years. Because remember, um, in May of 2022, when uh, an eclipse happened, I think it was a, one of these lunar eclipses that um, cryptocurrency coin Luna crashed. And it wiped out like $60 billion worth of value in the cryptocurrency space and really shook up um, and started leading to a decline in like Bitcoin and other stuff like that. And then six months after that, in November of 2022, one year ago, the last time there was a, a Taurus eclipse, a Taurus lunar eclipse was the FTX crash, mm -hmm. which centered like right on that eclipse where in a matter of days, this entire company just like crashed and it became one of the biggest financial um, not just debacles, but um, I can't think of the word like swindling of of like a a scheme in history that just like collapsed. And don't we don't we have the trial um, of the the owner leader whatever head CEO of uh, of the FTX? Isn't that trial happening now? Um, I mean, I know he's like getting charged with stuff, so maybe it is. Yeah, I, I don't know if those dates are going to line up. Yeah, somebody yeah. in the comments says it is. Yeah, that and so it'd be interesting to look at the the last eclipse in this series, which marked the collapse of that house of cards, and see how that correlates with um, uh, with sentencing or whatever. Um, yeah, it's interesting because the the you know this, these eclipses in Taurus have been with Uranus, and you know Uranus and Taurus, which we've just talked about for a long time one of the things that one of the things that uranus and taurus always brings um one of the things it shakes up in addition to food which this time it's led to massive inflation and food prices um but it shakes up food and money right um taurus connects us to fundamentals 
um, which we'd say is basic, but you know, it's it's they're they're fundamental in the sense that so much rests on top of what money is worth and what food is available. And so having the eclipses hit that the Uranus and Taurus project, which cryptocurrency did not begin under Uranus and Taurus, but it became huge under Uranus and Taurus. Uranus moved into Taurus for the first time in 2018. Um, and that was the first year everyone was like, holy shit, this Bitcoin thing. Let me tell you, I wish I'd gotten back, gotten into it back in blah, 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 blah. Um, and so we have the eclipses, um, you know, hitting that sort of project. Um, again, the eclipse, the eclipses on uh, Uranus and Taurus have also, um, you know, completely fucked with global food supply through the the, the sort of vector of the Russo-Ukrainian war. Um, as well as uh, COVID, uh, logistical things, but the the one of the net result that um, eclipses with Uranus and Taurus has pointed to is this 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 um, this eclipsing or disruption of what are supposed to be givens, right? Food and money, right? The most fundamental material necessities sometimes. And um, in doing the eclipses research, I came to understand better and redefine better my keywords that I always use for eclipses for years, which is that they represent great endings and great beginnings. And I realized like some of where that comes from is in some instances, some of the things we see with like world leaders passing away is that like, sometimes there's no greater end to something than like the death of something either literally or metaphorically. And that that's one of the things that comes along with eclipses and that can be metaphorical and that it can represent the death of a relationship it can represent the death of like a career or like your job, like doing a specific job at work and beginning a new one. Um, but this theme of like endings of things, but then also how that sometimes opens you up for a new beginning in that area at the same time. And one of the analogies I thought of recently was how in nature, sometimes when you get a forest that like grows up and there's so much overgrowth that eventually like a lightning will strike and there'll be a wildfire and it'll burn away so much of the forest. But then in the process, it will sort of lay the ground for like new growth, um, which is like a natural part of the cycle that's necessary and that can get messed up if that process like doesn't happen periodically. Yeah. And in, you know, in a lot of regions like the one I live in, um, we have hundreds of species that depend on the occasional forest fire to complete mm. their cycle. Um, like the things, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's actually, it's built in. Um, but um, yeah, with, you know, sort of endings and beginnings, like one of the oldest and simplest uh, ways of thinking about the eclipses, right, is the king is dead, long live the new king, right? When you have the head of, when the head of state is decapitated, you need a new head of state, right? It's the beginning of a new regime. And you saw that quite literally with uh, the uh, the history of uh, kingship in England and kingship, yeah. of course. <clears throat> right, for sure. Um, yeah, with pretty much every king in the UK in the 20th century, it was really wild to see that and the end of one era and the beginning of another. Um, so I think people can think of that, you know, in their personal lives in terms of looking at where this eclipse and the Libra eclipse fell as some of the themes of like, where is one era ending and another era is beginning. Um, but with the Taurus eclipse, it should be something that's been building or in the process of happening for a while now in six month increments. And um, I'm trying to think, you know, in, ter in terms of current world events, I'm, I'm a little, you know, this is the one that started two years ago, I think, when Biden um, was oh, temporarily yeah. to do that procedure, like right on a Taurus eclipse. And I'm a little nervous about him. This is the last time this falls in his sixth house. And he hasn't been looking very, um, like, vigorous lately. He's been looking more tired than usual, probably due to all the traveling. Um, but I hope that he doesn't have any problems with this falling in his sixth house for the last time since that one two years ago did coincide with the temporary giving of power to Kamala Harris when he was under for an operation for like a day or something like that. Um, we'll see how that goes. And yeah, well, and, and he does have because he has the moon so early in Taurus, as we were discussing the other day, of the all of the eclipses in Taurus, this is the one that is closest to the natal moon. So there's mm -hmm. certainly reason for concern. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll see, um, you know, we're having a very rare Mars 
Sun conjunction that doesn't happen very often um, over the past century coming up in November. And he actually has like a Sun Mars conjunction in his in his 12th house. So that's something we might talk about more later when we get to that that conjunction. It's a, one more thing that I think this eclipse connects to, and that uh, again, what this cl- eclipse connects to also connects to a lot of November, because it's the same. It's the same planets in Scorpio and Taurus um, during the eclipse, and then for several weeks after the eclipse. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we we've discussed the Jupiter Uranus both being in Taurus, and how that's correlated with. Um, to say like really vigorous labor, organized labor action in the United States, maybe other places too. I know about it happening in the U S um, and, you know, with the writer strike, we've got the auto worker strike, obviously the actor strike, we have um, a, a nurse's strike. Um, and, you know, we discussed last month and maybe before that, like Jupiter Uranus, this is, so if, you know, Uranus likes to change the basic things, Uranus and Taurus, so food, money, and then labor. Right. Like act, just people working to um, make sure the trains run on time, the food gets delivered, like all this like fundamental um, the things don't run without them. Um, and so, you know, Jupiter Uranus, uh, we've got that until the end of next May. So we expect I expect um, more vigorous organized labor action. But this eclipse on that point and with the opposition from Mars in particular, um, seems like a difficult point for these uh, the this sort of swell of organized labor movement. Um, I, it is tempting or hopeful to see the moon being with Jupiter as a positive thing, but um, I, I just think back to when we were looking at we were looking at uh, a lunar eclipse. Uh, or no, we were looking at a solar eclipse. It was an eclipse. It was a solar eclipse right next to Jupiter in December of 2019. Um, And we saw, you know, in retrospect, uh, we saw that a little bit in forespect too, um, but we saw that the eclipse didn't help Jupiter and it didn't benefit um, from having Jupiter there. In fact, the eclipse kind of ruined Jupiter and right. so I, I would prefer that not to be the case, but seeing this eclipse near the Jupiter Uranus, I, I guess I, I can't bring myself to assume that it's going to help these things. We famously disagreed about that one, and I was trying to see it more positively, and I was like, maybe that Jupiter co-presence, maybe that'll help this eclipse not be so as terrible as it looks. Um, and we disagreed about that on like the December mm-hmm. 2019 forecast, or maybe like the 2020 forecast. I am here to say today, and I'm willing, I'm going to be the bigger man and say, I lost that debate. Like you were right on that one. That was a good call back yes. then because that ended up being the COVID eclipse. Um, and that's such a funny constant tension we've had over the years with the forecast episodes of like when to lean into the negative stuff when we see it versus when to try to see what the positive side is. Or, or I sometimes am not paranoid, but concerned not to only focus on the negative stuff, but to try to see some of the bright, brighter sides of things as well, because I don't want to go too far in either direction. Um, but it's interesting seeing that as a tension of forecast to forecast, like how we deal with that, especially in months where things are really hard. Yeah. Well, and you know, the the balance point, right, is that why bother doing astrology at all if it's not going to be useful, right? Mm. It's not useful. Um, to feel trapped in a uh, like a, a an assembly line of doom where you're being dragged in inex- inexorably towards a torturous future you can do nothing about right? right that doesn't help you navigate but then you know it's also equally equally but differently useless um, to be imagining that around the next corner um, is the realization of all your hopes and dreams and the cessation of all your difficulties. And so, you know, we're trying to navigate between promising false positives um, and, you know, and creating despair about negatives, right? Because the thing about negatives is they tend to expand in the mind to fill everything, even if it's just, it's a shit couple days and then it's over. Um, You know, it's hard. uh, It's a a function of the mind that we tend to focus on the bad thing that's going to happen. So, I mean, yeah, we're always trying to navigate that and i think we have different ideas sometimes to what would be most useful but i do think that we're both trying to 
you know, be of service and to be useful. Cause what's the point, you know, if it's not useful. Yeah. Well, and sometimes in like, as astrologers, we also have the experience sometimes in our personal lives of like seeing a difficult transit coming up, knowing what the worst case scenario might be and sometimes anticipating that, but then it comes and it happens and it's not, it's something bad or annoying, but it's not the worst case scenario and you sort of get through it. Um, so that I, I commonly want to give room for that so that we don't overstate the point, but then sometimes months, years like 2020 happen or months like this past month happens. And sometimes it, you know, it is the worst case scenario for, for people. And so leaving room for that or acknowledging that is very important. It, um, just a note about that. Um, the, I would say most of the times where things have ended up being bad and they looked bad in the astrology ahead of time. A lot of times we were unable to escape a really difficult um, interpretation. I remember planning the 2020 yearly with you and Kelly and even Kelly, who was our, our, uh, our bouquet of positivity um, <laughs> as a counterpoint for many years. Um, couldn't I was I remember I literally asked Kelly I was like okay here's what I'm seeing Pl like please put like put a spin on it like how could find the silver lining for me and she's like can't do it right? right and you know I think it was telling that like there was no there was no way around it and you know there's a little uh to on a, um at a smaller scale we had some of the same dynamic last month where it's like no this is not this like Mars K2 square Pluto heading into eclipses. This is not, you know, like this, this is, uh, this is, this is going to be hard for a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. And our famously in our 2020 year ahead forecast, our famous phrase, uh, all time legendary phrase that there will be no hugging in the third week of March of 2020 <laughs> and how that ended up yeah. becoming very literally true during the lockdowns. Yeah. All right. So it's feeling. No, no touchy or feely at all for for a good month or two there. So um, let's redirect back to this eclipse really quickly. A couple of more points. Mercury-Mars conjunction, I want to give some keywords for that because that's happening the day of the eclipse and it goes exact the next day on October 29th. So I was writing down phrases like a war of words, verbal aggression, using communication systems for fighting or for war shooting the messenger, malicious lies. Traditionally, Mercury-Mars combinations were um, dishonesty or lying aspects. Mm -hmm. And also heated debates um, are some of the things that come up for me with that. And then Mars opposite Jupiter happening at the same time, for me more broadly, feels like the tension or like a tug of war between you know, war and peace at its most simple. Like those literally traditionally are the two planets of war and peace are Mars and Jupiter. And um, those being themes of being pulled in those two direction, different directions at that time. And um, obviously that how that applies in world events, but then also even in personal lives, like the, the it being unclear sometimes, like when to be aggressive versus when to make peace and like what's called for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you also will see in addition to the very valid war and peace for Mars and Jupiter, you will also see when they combine together, it's always um, on Mars's side. Um, when you have Mars Jupiter combinations, they virtually never uh, end up looking like, oh, Mars is helping Jupiter be peaceful and chill and abundant. It looks like Jupiter um, giving Mars extra confidence and uh, imagining victory. You see, um, Mars Jupiter um in the charts of like champions in um in warfare and combative sports it's Jupiter being like yes Mars you can do it you can crush them all which is um you know maybe what we'd not like for world events right now but you know even when they do work together it's it's in it it looks like Mars it doesn't look like Jupiter uh thank you uh in the comments Diana points out uh Bruce Lee is a good example of Mars in Scorpio opposite Jupiter in Taurus right and there's there's that like champion I'm the best energy yeah so so sometimes Mars Jupiter can be like the expansion of war um rather than the cessation of war yeah and in Firmicus you'll see when there's a like a positive um uh, when there's a positive Mars um, position in a chart, a lot of times Firmicus will tell you to see if it has an aspect to Jupiter. And then if it does, 
the martial power will be um uh, will be supported by law and the person will have the they, they, they literally in for because it says oh this person gets an army um and i'm thinking of mars jupiter mars in a night chart in the ninth with an as any aspect to jupiter gives um the power of eus gladiae um which is like the the power to judge life and death legally within the empire right so you have that jupiter supporting mars which you yeah. know again is uh we don't need more martial enthusiasm i don't think this month but that's where it is uh on a global stage i don't love that on a personal level that can be useful right like that's you being like mars and scorpio for some people right now for you know not not too few people um is saying here here are some really difficult things that you're going to need to be a badass in order to overcome or solve and some of that jupiter energy may be helpful there not necessarily during the moment of the eclipse but this basically you know th these hold as a configuration through the beginning of uh through the beginning of the month Right, for sure. Um, do you have any other Mercury Mars keywords besides some of the ones that I gave? Just as well, general pretty, keywords, it was a pretty good list. Um, yeah. You know, uh, there's the it's it's very much the them's fighting words uh, combination. Right, for sure. Um, okay, so and then I mentioned also at the end of last forecast the Venus trine Uranus on the October thirty first on Halloween, which is a brief positive aspect. Then we move into the first week of November very first thing that happens it's very important is saturn stations direct in pisces at zero degrees of pisces on november 4th um so this is very important because this is only our second station of saturn since it moved into pisces earlier this year in march so we're still getting a feel of what saturn in pisces is all about and it's especially at the stationary points that suddenly saturn becomes louder and that um, there's sort of an exclamation mark behind it. So the last time or the first time that Saturn station in Pisces, of course, was June. And that was the week where all of a sudden the submarine fiasco happened, where there was there was supposed to be that submarine disaster. And for a week, the news was talking about these like four or five people trapped in a submarine. It later turned out that it had imploded almost immediately, but there was still just the spectacle of it and just like that millions of people around the world were thinking about this scenario of like what if you were trapped in a submarine and couldn't get out was such a um saturn and pisces thing archetypally that i think it's worth remembering that because we have this station coming up here and we may see similar themes coming up um broadly speaking not necessarily like a submarine but other things related to what that archetype represents yeah and that um that sort of danger from the water element right um you know uh yeah like the the risk of drowning the risk of flooding storms um is further attested to by the mars and scorpio you know we have both malefics in water signs and so looking you know uh, the kinds of things you often see especially around that mars conjunct the sun in scorpio which um which will which happens later in the month but this is all again part and parcel of sort of the same unit of time um historically those mars sun conjunctions um had tons of tons of epic uh storms and floods um and you know i, I would probably further extend that to keeping an eye on um naval and nautical situations um you know i, I would be surprised if both malefics and water signs getting such emphasis doesn't give us some um some trouble with boats yeah um i and i was thinking when you mentioned that the water aspect um in our pre-show chat one of the first things that came to mind is just that that's one of the biggest humanitarian crises that's, that's happening right now in gaza is there's no water and so people oh, yeah. are being consumed by the there's headlines right now gaza consumed by a hunt for water gaza is dying of thirst tainted water and viruses put Gaza residents, especially kids, at further danger. Remember, that was one of the themes we talked about was um, polluted water in previous forecasts when talking about Saturn in, in Pisces or, or tainted water, poisoned water and things like that. Or there was, yeah. there was other keywords like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't remember which episode it was, but I remember talking about, yeah, don't drink the water. 
Uh, there's lead in the water. There's plastics in the water. There's, you know, whatever. Like there, there's the list of 500 things in the water and how that's been getting, that's been get the water safety and potability has been getting more attention since Saturn moved into Pisces. Somebody in the comments said they love your adding, putting eye drops in <laughs> as you talk about water. That's a good, well, that's a good thing because that's the counteraction to dryness, which Saturn and Pisces, it would be about thing water drying up, a lack of water um, being parched. But then the counterbalance of that is that you have to somehow add water or moisture into things or import it from another source in order to counteract that. And that's part of the the solution or like symbolically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, half the time, right? This the the Saturn Pisces seems it it you know it, it's the you have that quality of there's just no, there's not the right amount of water, right? There's no water coming in, or you know, um, to harken back to the submarine tragedy, right? There's water, water everywhere, but like ni neither of those serve life, right? Neither of those are like the the um, life sustaining type and uh, amount of water. For sure. Um, the other thing I thought about, which I mentioned earlier, was just how it seemed like there's been different stages, but certainly it was notable to me the the assassination of that Israeli president that was involved in the Oslo Accords in the mid-90s during Saturn and Pisces and how that represented a real challenge to the peace process, that the peace process basically started falling apart after that, even though it almost seemed like it was perhaps within reach for a period of time in the 90s. Um, but like that there's something symbolically there about, because Pisces, I feel like is the most compassionate sign. I think that's one of the, the things we discussed about um, almost sometimes to its detriment in some instances. Um, and that that could be relevant here somehow, themes of like peace and like the tension uh, or how peace is something that's like hard to work for. I was reading a a thing where one of the other Israeli prime ministers, Shimon Perez, said something that peace is not always strategic, and that his tensions with some of the the people that were on the right wing in Israel was that they wanted strategic. They're thinking strategically, and he said that it, that peace is not always strategically good for you, but it's the thing that's more morally or ethically motivated or necessary. And that was an interesting distinction to think about like strategy or security as coming from some other sort of motivation versus being motivated by one's ethics or one's morals or other things like that. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. Sure. And that you're so, right in that, that Saturn and Neptune, or excuse me, Saturn and Pisces bring that tension because Saturn is the strategic Saturn is like, well, in the long run, looking at the numbers and this and that, like you get, you know, you get a cold real politic um, calculation out of Saturn, but Saturn in this, you know, in Jupiter's place, trying to do uh, a more moral or ethical calculation. But as Saturn has, uh, there's an uh, experiences, a, a conflict between those two layers of analysis and then what planning uh, or position to take as a result of that. Yeah, for sure. So that's one of the things happening, um, complementing that in the first week of the month. Um, here's a graphic from Archetypal Explorer, shout out archetypalexplorer.com, where um, happening around the same time as that Saturn station is that Venus opposes Neptune. Um, and at the same time, so that's on February 3rd and the previous day on, on around February 2nd, November. we have or yeah, thank you. Why am I saying February? Um, November 2nd, the sun is opposing Jupiter at the same time. And then the day after those, we have a Mercury Uranus opposition on the fourth. So I wasn't sure about like itemizing all of those instead of just doing the big aspects this month, but they're just like some of the early, we get a sequence of early inner planet aspects right in the first few days. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, we've got, you know, Mercury, Mars, Sun, all marching, um, uh, all marching through that opposition to Jupiter, right? And then moving on to the opposition with Uranus, um, while um, Venus is doing something totally different, right? Opposing Neptune, trining Pluto um, before, um, you know, a relatively happy ingress into Libra on the 8th. 
Yeah. So um, the Venus Neptune sounds like what we were talking about, though, with some of the the attempts for peace, but the uh, ne the nebulousness of relationships and um, issues and tensions that arise over boundaries. Because Neptune struggles with boundaries; it's boundaryless, um, and that sometimes that can make human interactions a little bit dicey when boundaries are not clear as one of the themes that's coming up there on the third, whereas on the fourth, we get unexpected communications, um, a message that comes out of left field, a disruption in communication, um, and other themes like that. Um, that jarring are, messages. Yeah, jarring mes messages, disruptive disruptions in communication. Um, and then with the Sun-Jupiter on the second, what do you? what is that? That's like again, that tension with sort of peace that we were talking about earlier, I guess. Yeah. Um, what's interesting, right, with Jupiter and Taurus, um, you know, so the, the sun's opposition with that is basically the halfway point of Jupiter and Taurus. Um, well, it'll end right after the, the sun-Jupiter conjunction um, in uh, six months from November. Um, and so it's Jupiter very bright opposite the sun, right? Jupiter is going to be rising at sunset. Um, and, you know, it shows a tension, right? Because the Jupiter and Taurus is trying to make things better by stabilizing them, right? By providing the basics, by figuring out, um, you know, how to keep, how to get the fundamentals in line in order to make the rest of the the complex parts of life more livable right to at mm. least have the basics taken care of right at least there's yeah. food i don't have to worry about that um yeah, the and, necessities yeah yeah and so having you know this point of the sun opposite that you know it highlights that how important it is to have the basics right which we're already um seeing in the news with you know a million people or whatever not having the basics um, but it, it highlights how important that is while the sun is doing the exact opposite thing. And in this case with Mars. And so it both underscores the importance of what Jupiter in Taurus is trying to show and the benefit of that, while at the same time, like making it very difficult. Um, but some, you know, it's like lack highlighting the importance of something. Yeah, for sure. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so I meant to mention briefly, uh, since Saturn's stationing at zero degrees of Pisces, anybody that has Saturn in late, late Aquarius, like especially 28, 29 Aquarius, this is actually going to be the final pass of your Saturn return, even though that's mainly a sign-based technique, like it coming back within three degrees could reactivate that again. And that's why at the end of this episode, I'm actually going to put out a call for Saturn return stories, because now once this station happens, then it's time to finally do the Saturn and Aquarius retrospective, I think. Um, uh, so worth, go ahead. just one thing. Um, so this Saturn's direct station here mm -hmm. starts a forward March for Saturn. That'll get it all the way to 19 uh, Pisces during the late second quarter wow. of, um, or it's sort of, uh, basically like, I think it's June, July is the retrograde station, but yeah, it gets all the way to 19. That's far. That's really, yeah. Far. Yeah. For those of us with planets at four and 14. You know, it was uh, worth noting. Saturn, Saturn's coming for you. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. So this is the turning point where that that March begins. Um, so that's kind of the first week. That kind of brings us to the second week, where the major thing, the major shift that occurs, is Venus departs from its month or so long transit through Virgo, and it moves into the sign of Libra on November uh, the eighth. So this is a major shift. And one of the things I noted actually in terms of the astrology that's really cool and could be a helpful triggering event is that the moon actually moves into Pisces and conjoins Venus almost immediately after Venus goes into Libra. So we get like a very nice looking moon-Venus conjunction on November 9th, um, late on the 8th, early on the 9th, right after Venus has gone in on the 8th. Um, so this is something I like, and that could be like a, one of those brief sort of like positive event type mm -hmm. alignments that happen, especially that night. Yeah, that sort of good day in a bad week sort of energy. But more than that, like, you know, Venus is going to be in Libra for the rest of the month. 
Um, and so, you know, a planet ingress like that is a tonal shift, um, but it usually needs um, an aspect from the moon to like for that to impact. And so with the, the moon conjoining it just the next day after the ingress, um, we, we, it, it, the, that <clears throat> that facilitates that so it's as i say it doesn't you know we were talking about this before the podcast it doesn't turn november into an easy cool fun time um but it is it is notably more positive and you know from a how can venus and libra help right it's uh, so it you know technically it's a benefic and it's in the sign of its rulership um, but it's like helping to get balanced, right? Because things can be difficult and they're only made more difficult if you don't have equilibrium. Um, you know, if you're able to kind of, uh, I was going to say, return, uh, uh, remember your center and then manage the wobbling scales, right? Like from a position of being centered, at least you're balanced, even if you are going through an obstacle course, right? It doesn't necessarily change the terrain, um, but having equilibrium makes a huge difference in the experience and uh, of navigating it as well as our capacity to do so. And I think the the Venus is uh, offering that. Yeah, for sure. Especially as it's it's going to be cleaning up from that Mars transit that we, you know, that sort of culminated in early October with the Mars Pluto square. As, as it was um, leading things to be unbalanced or leading to to different extremes. So Venus going into her home sign and then sort of like cleaning up after Mars and maybe balancing the scales out um, with Libra as a as a cold air sign, having a detachedness that's somewhat necessary sometimes to um, cool down, uh, I guess, social conflicts especially, and to make sure that there's um, balance on both sides. Yeah. And, you know, that that point, the word you use, detachment, is uh, especially relevant this year because we have the South Node in Libra. And the South Node gives, uh, you know, in addition to all the Eclipse stuff, it gives a quality of detachment, um, which isn't always helpful. Um, but it's, it's you know, there the South Node gives this depersonalization um, it, it, it prompts a withdrawal of egoic identification, um, which is good for getting distance. Um, and, you know, from, uh, in this case, like, a, a, um, a conflict or a difficulty, which you're too inside of to make sense of, or too inside of to figure out how to balance. And so again, although not like classically a benefic, certainly like the south node in this context can be helpful for sure um one of the other things i like about venus going through libra is we see um in november around november 9th and 10th mercury changes signs and it um, will immediately square saturn which is a difficult um, aspect on that day but um it then sets us up for um, a Mercury Venus sextile, yeah, which which eventually completes later on, especially around November fifteenth, around the middle of the month, and that to me feels like an easing of communication, um, and communication moving away from this like Mercury Mars conjunction, which was at the end of October and beginning of November, and this like combativeness, um, and this debate and this um more polarized sort of communication. You move into this period of more harmonious communication um, that is flowing a lot, lot better at that point. Yeah, this is um, I, th yeah, this is part of a, a sequence of sort of lightening the load and making things more navigable. Um, and as you pointed out, the first day that Mercury moves into Sag, it's kind of a bummer because it hits Saturn immediately, right? right. The Saturn, which just stationed, so looking at the like the weight of what cannot be changed what simply must be endured etc cetera, etc cetera. but as soon as it's done with that which is uh, almost immediately it mercury begins chasing a sextile with venus right with right. venus just ingressed into libra and there as you said chris there it's breaking the mercury mars co-presence right mm -hmm. which in scorpio is so um, not only does it uh, result in negative communications and communications about negative things um, but it, it's also, it's just like, it's a harsh, depressing sort of train of thought, whereas Mercury and Sag 
uh, even though it's in its detriment, Mercury and Sag is trying to see the positive, right? It's a right. Jupiter ruled sign. It's trying to find, um, you know, something, something that's maybe not so bad. Um, and I will note that um, the first decan of Sagittarius is uh, a Mercury decan. And so Mercury does have a little power here that it doesn't have in uh, most spaces in Sag. So that, and not only, you know, do we have all those changes and we have an exact Mercury Venus sextile, but Mercury and Venus stay um, in sextiled signs, right? In Libra and Sag, at least in that that relationship uh, for a lot of the rest of the month. And that's, that's helpful, right? Because we're kind of, you know, we started this month on a pretty brutal note. And so we're trying to kind of find anything that has buoyancy or that can kind of help dig us out a little bit, you know, I'm for. Right. And, and this is this is part of that it may not be the world's best yeah. shovel, but it's still a shovel for sure. And and the contrast, I'm so glad you brought that up with Mercury in Sagittarius, because optimism is such a core trait and it's the corrective trait over Scorpio, which has more of a pessimism. But also um, some of the key words are like it has like a paranoia or a suspicion to it. And I have I say that as a Mercury in Scorpio, that the, the, the shadow side of the Mercury in Scorpio can be. A paranoia it can be a suspicion run amok um partially due to an awareness of like vulnerabilities um like an awareness of one's own vulnerabilities and a paranoia about not having those exploited as well as seeing vulnerabilities of others um and i think that's one of the shifts is like we're dealing with a lot of that and the argumentativeness of that of mercury and scorpio but then it, it has to go through some sort of barrier here when it, it switches signs into Sagittarius on the 9th and 10th, and then immediately like runs into this wall with Saturn and Pisces, which is just recently stationed. And then it moves into this more optimistic Sagittarius with the sextile with Venus. So it's like there's something about that, that event there of that Mercury running into a barrier or a wall with Saturn that it has to like let go of some of that energy for some reason because it runs into an obstacle where those are like no longer i don't know like tenable traits to continue to maintain that 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 there's been sort of some sort of change in the script that's requiring um you know a, a change in how communication is done at this point yeah well i think you know usually when mercury ingresses into sag there's like a burst of optimism and mm -hmm. that initial burst totally gets stepped on by the square with Saturn, but right. then it's sort of like, oh, there's there nothing to feel good or to you know think to think good about, mm -hmm. um, and yes, there is because immediately um, Mercury begins moving into a uh, sextile with a dignified ben benefic, right? But it's it's not the Jupiterian optimism; it's the Venusian optimism. That, Maybe it's Mercury like the, gets a shot of the the hard work of peace or something could be like the keyword of Saturn and Pisces and Mercury running into that where it's like Mercury has the optimism of wanting to go in that direction but then realizes it's going to be some work like there's going to be some work to head into that direction and it's not all just like like fun and games yeah it's like well we might not be able to change the you know the larger scale parameters of this this obstinate thing in our lives but like there are like in this structure that i don't love that i would rather do a little architectural revision of there's actually a, there are a number of things that can be done to make this better right like the venusian like i don't love the way this room is shaped but i don't have to have a pile of rotting trash in the corner right what if i got rid of that <laughs> right put some flowers yeah. in instead for sure um so and then i'm trying to think of other mercury saturn keywords for that time around the 10th but i know in previous years like slowness of communication has been an issue like i remember the election a few years ago now when mercury stationed i think square saturn and it was like the votes took forever to like count and so there was a delay in finding out the results um so slowness in communication um precision or even like editing, like Saturn can see the um, faults in something very well. So sometimes Mercury-Saturn combinations can be good at um, getting to the core of what's wrong with something and seeing the faults in something, although that can sometimes be productive or not productive. Yeah. It's like, okay, you got to go over it again. Right. Yeah. You got to re redo the entire manuscript because you found a bunch of typos. Yeah. 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 All right. So... 
that brings us to a bunch of configurations that start happening around our first lunation of the month. Um, our first lunation is the Scorpio new moon on the 13th. And like right before that, Mars opposes Uranus. That goes exact on the 11th. And the sun opposes Uranus around the same time. So we've got some major Mars-Uranus aspects going on here and Sun-Uranus aspects going on here during this time frame as we get towards the middle of the month. I mean, um, it, it's really like it's a blob of Sun, Mars, Moon, opposite Uranus, right? We've got yeah. a couple days of that. Um, I was, um, so usually I look forward to the first non-eclipsed new moon or full moon after a cycle of eclipses right. with some level of relief or hope. And I was yeah. like, I was clicking through and I was like, oh yeah. And then, oh yeah. So right. It's oh. a sun moon Mars conjunction and it's almost exactly opposite Uranus. Yeah. So that, yeah. that rocks the, that, you know, um, like we're trying to get some balance here. We've got that Mercury Venus, like there's been a, some positive developments, but uh, this is, this is rough. Like this is in intense would be the best case scenario. Yeah. It's like communication starts flowing again. And there's like this diplomacy between Mercury and, and Venus, but then all of a sudden there's this sudden um, dramatic or almost like violent upset between Mars and Uranus, especially that is such an explosive type of energy um, where Mars is, yeah, explosive and Uranus is like sudden, unexpected, the thing that comes out of nowhere. And it's also happening in an opposition, which is the most tense aspect and sometimes manifests in an externalization of the energy through others rather than an internalization of it. Yeah, it's really, there's some volatile fluids um, present during this uh, this new moon. For sure. Um, so that's very tense. Um, Uranus aspects also, also make me think of like, like Uranus is very freedom oriented, is very, doesn't want to be restricted. So so the, the calls for freedom and like the urge for freedom is very intense at this time. Um, sometimes so much so that it's it's willing to be combative in order to achieve that end. Um, what else is going on in this new moon chart uh, that's relevant here? What other keywords do we have for that? <clears throat> I don't I don't like that immediately after the new moon takes place that then it's like the moon then just immediately applies to opposing Uranus and then conjoining Mars, basically. Yeah, I mean it's it's kind of all the same night, right. And this is looks like it's um, late on the twelfth and early on November thirteenth. Yeah. So yeah, for Western Hemisphere, like uh, Sunday night, Monday morning. Right. There it is. So yeah, it's but uh, so I guess the the positive um, or the yeah the not so another angle on that is that's the last really. Um, like that's the last, I don't know, um, stick of dynamite that goes off. Um, we're, we're the, the, mm. the sun and Mars and Mercury have all now opposed Uranus. They're not going to go back and do that again. Um, and so we're headed towards the exact sun Mars conjunction, right? Yeah. That's why I and, wouldn't, I don't know if that would use that well, phrase, but that's not, I, don't, last. I would say that's not an unexpected stick of dynamite. That's a, like, what does all of this mean? Right. Cause it, in a sense, it's like a new moon for the Mars cycle, right? It's like, okay, here's where the Mars cycle starts and it's going to go for two years. Um, and so, yeah, I, and but so, I'm, I'm nervous about that just because when I was trying to do database research with Nick yesterday, we kept coming up with like shootings as like a major sun Mars correlation and bombs sometimes. Um, I have a bunch of other keywords that are more constructive than that, but but I was a little nervous about that sun Mars conjunction in Scorpio because of the some of that empirical research that we're doing about that. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I expect it to sort of set the paradigm you know, it kind of sets the site, resets the cycle for Mars things, which is war and violence um, mm -hmm. and engineering. When I looked at the two previous Mars sun 
conjunctions in Scorpio in the 20th century. Uh, both of them had some, uh, there were some nice advances in engineering, particularly material science. Um, and there were a bunch of, uh, there were a bunch of uh, water-based natural disasters. Um, I didn't see any new wars start. There were certainly um, <clears throat> installments of violence in ongoing wars, but I think it sets the paradigm for, um, you know, for what are the for the next two years of military endeavors, which is meaningful for the Russo-Ukraine war. It's meaningful for what this um Hamas Israel thing is going to look like and I'm not saying oops um when I say it's not like a fresh explosion it's like okay it's it's sort of gathering in what do all of these explosions and tragedies what is that going to what paradigm does that set for warfare and conflict for this whole next cycle um, yeah. and I'm not saying that's good but it's it's more the collecting and uh the collecting and distillation of what that means rather than a new installment more setting the the direction yeah that's a great point so it resets the cycle and the the relationship between the sun and mars and so let's talk about that that's a very important aspect it's the sun conjunct mars which goes exact on november 18th in scorpio um, it's happening opposite to uranus but also trying to pluto trying to neptune and sextile pluto um, it turns out that these conjunctions in Scorpio don't happen very often. This is the first one in 32 years, I believe you said, right? Yeah. And then the previous one, 32 years before that. And so what's interesting about 32 is that that connects with the Venus cycle. So both of our previous instances, there were two in the 20th century. It's 32 years and then 32 years, and then it skipped. So we got to go basically 60 some years and we're in the 19th century, Um but uh, yeah, the two previous ones both happened just like this year where we had the Venus retrograde in Leo over the summer and then the Sun-Mars conjunction in Scorpio in uh, in Q4. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I was trying to look back at, let's see, I wrote down some keywords for things that were coming up, both things that were coming up empirically and then things that were coming up in terms of just the archetypal meaning of Sun conjunct Mars. Um, like I said, there were some shootings or bombings that came up. One of the shootings was like Robert Kennedy, for example, was assassinated close to Sun Mars conjunction in 1968. Um, but other interpretations are like things moving quickly, things that move fast, happening abruptly, starting fast, ending abruptly, um, heat, fire, hotness, hot headedness, force fighting, combat, special forces, especially since it's in Scorpio, prosecutors, detectives, courage, ambition, leadership, daring, taking action, vigor, impulsivity, over-aggressiveness, and forcefulness. Um, those are some of the keywords. Funny one I found was actually um, that, that fit for this um, pretty well when I was looking for people with sun, Mars conjunctions, um, and you're you're actually the artist with your favorite song. Nelly was born with the sun and Mars in Scorpio in his famous song, It's Getting Hot in Here, which I believe is your famous favorite song, correct? Um yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so that's probably a good theme song for the Sun Mars conjunction. Like what better theme song for that? It's getting it's hot getting in here. It's getting hot in here, so put on blast resistant and bulletproof uh clothing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, other person who was born with this Sun Mars conjunction, I believe in 1959, or very close to this conjunction that I thought was very entertaining was Nancy Grace, um, who was like a, you know, she has a complex story because she's kind of a controversial figure. Her Wikipedia entry has like 10 pages of controversies because she, um, I don't know how to tell her story, but she's controversial for, for doing like a CNN show where her personal life story is when she was 19, her fiance was shot and killed by a former coworker um, so that she actually became a prosecutor as a result of this and went into the legal profession and then eventually went into broadcasting because she wanted to be a victim's rights advocate. But then um, in her show, she would kind of like rile people up about murder cases and she would sometimes in some instances, be wrong in terms of who she accused of being a victim, including this one 
mother she brought on the show at one point who she said she thought did it and asked her a lot of in, in retrospect inappropriate questions but later it turned out that the mother hadn't done it um but sometimes she would still just like stick to it dogmatically despite that and some of the more negative traits of like rushing to judgment or assuming people were guilty um were some of the things that would come out with okay that. so that's too good um right. because yeah. do you know what what part, um, like what part or lot the Sun Mars relationship gives us? What's that? The lot of punishment. Mm, okay. So it's the arc between the Sun and Mars projected from the ascendant. So Nancy Grace has the lot of pun of the punishment or the punisher conjunct the ascendant. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty and, good. And so it's the you know it's that the Sun part right is the like. Um, the authority, whether societal or moral. Um, and then Mars is interesting because Mars is like both the act of punishing, right, with Mars, but is also the criminal, right? So that that you have the lot of punishment, which when you look at it in natal charts can be somebody who is obsessed with seeking the punishment of others. Um, uh, but it can also be a point where one is punished for one's actions, depending on the configuration. And so that um, she, uh, so there, so, excuse me, we find Mars and the sun in Scorpio much more often than we find that exact conjunction. And so just um, because we've been talking about it, and it's very quick to say the exact conjunction um, last time was in 91. It was in November of 1991. And then the previous one, which Nancy Grace was born next to, uh, was on the 29th of October in 1959. And those are the only two in the 20th century. Right. Yeah, I was trying to research other ones. Um, some of them were just Sun Mars co presences mm -hmm. in Scorpio without the exact conjunction. But like one that was really close that was interesting was Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, has it in his third house. And I thought it was really funny because he founded like one of the most, uh, what was it, controversial, vitriolic, contentious, contentious like communications platforms in the history of the world with a Sun Mars conjunction in the third house of communication. That's pretty good. Um, Jonas Salk was one of the more positive ones, invented the polio vaccine and didn't patent it. Um, Grace Kelly, it was tricky. She died in a car accident. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio as a sun Mars conjunction in Scorpio mm -hmm. just had that movie come out. Um, Pat Tillman was another one who famously was like a football player who after nine 11 signed up for the army um, but he ended up getting killed in Afghanistan in like a friendly fire accident. Um, and then another was Robert Kennedy, of course, who I mentioned earlier, Sun, Mars, and Scorpio. And then Chloe Sevigny, um, who is an actress that was famous for the movie like Kids. And she was also an American psycho. But then she has in that big love. Right. And she has that Scorpio stellium in the first house. And then famously in the, she was like controversial in the early 2000s, where she did that one movie with her then boyfriend who was the director where they did like a real like oral sex scene basically on camera in this movie basically and it was one of the first times that that had, that had happened in like a major film or like motion picture so there's your yeah, other side sure people of the have made movies thing. of that before but yeah not, well not, not for wide release not for wide release not for the theatrical release so um that's the other side of the scorpio scorpio archetype there um Let's see. So let's just take a second, like on a personal level, like what does that mean? Like that reset, you're probably not planning, you know, a bombing campaign, um, but the this Mars sun still matters, right? Um, and so this is a really, you know, this is a really intense reset point for the Mars cycle um, from a like constructive, like normal human point of view. Um you know, uh, so, uh, you know, thinking about like, what is, so what is, what does a cycle of Mars look like, right? I think that we can use the language of a campaign, right? It's like, it's not one year, it's two years, right? Um, and so there's this, like, what, what am I, you know, what do I want to, <clears throat> what am I going to work through opposition and something that's going to like take struggle that I'm not, it, that's not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth seeing through over the next couple years. 
Right. Um, and you don't have to like make something up just so you have one during the conjunction, but because this will, this will bring like, this brings, this is a, an important inflection point in the Mars cycle. Um, it's like this in the retrograde are the two inflection points, like as you know, it, as those martial desires, right. To accomplish despite adversity, right. As those rise up, like, you know, you may see the shape um, of like a campaign that you want to go on. Um, and as you see, if you see that, if you feel that kind of emerging, be like, oh, this is going to be rough, but I, I'd love to, I'd love to get through to the other side and have accomplished all these things in two years. Like, you know, make a note of that and, you know, maybe make a moment of that as we get towards this conjunction in the middle of the month. Yeah, for sure. What is that, which, um, requires determination and like perseverance even in the face of hardship or that which requires you to have very long staying power to see through to completion yeah because this is this is a very powerful mars cycle right they they the mars cycle re resets in every sign throughout its cycle um and so this is one of the two right the other one being aries where it's resetting in, in its natural sign. And with uh, in Scorpio, of course, being the fixed sign, this is the one with the most staying power and determination, um, you know, and you know, dogged tenacity. Yeah, for sure. Um, I forgot to mention briefly, one of the last examples I forgot to mention with the sun, Mars, who had sun Mars opposite Uranus was Frida Kahlo and her injury in the bus accident happened under similar configurations to this whole alignment of sun Mars opposite Uranus. Yeah. And that was on, yeah. On top of, um, yeah, she was, she's sun opposite Mars. And I think the nodes are there too. And Uranus was it Mars Uranus opposite the sun natally yeah, with Jupiter, got... it's sun, Jupiter, Mars, Uranus, right. In the 12th yeah. and 6th. Yeah, she just has this big stellium opposite to that Mars Uranus conjunction. So Mars conjunct Uranus and Capricorn with a south node, and it's opposite yeah. to the Sun and Neptune and Jupiter in the north node in Cancer in the twelfth. And the transit that uh, that describes the timing of the you know kind of uh, story defining bus accident has a bunch of shit on top of that, doesn't it? Like that that axis is super lit up. Yeah, it ended up being a recurrence of that basically. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's the Sun Mars conjunction that is occurring there. And then around November 18th, um, you know, I mentioned those other keywords. There's also just like hot headedness and heat, like anything related to heat or any metaphor related to heat would be super relevant at that time. Um, because heat can cause you to be more irritable or agitated people can also act like impulsively when they're overheated and other things like that you can have like eruptions even like skin ones or other things mm -hmm. like that um all of those become relevant keywords yeah that i mean the the mars and the sun are the two hot planets right and together they create an uh, 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 uh quite an excess of heat right and, and too much right uh too much heat um uh, psychologically generally looks like anger Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so that starts taking us over into the following week where there is a shift that occurs. Um, the sun moves into Sagittarius on the 22nd and the 23rd. And then right after that, we get Mars moving into Sagittarius on the 23rd and 24th as well. And both of them immediately square Saturn at zero degrees of Pisces when that happens. So what we get is the opening of basically like a Mars-Saturn aspect or a Mars-Saturn square at this time, which is an aspect that we are familiar with that we talked about a lot in 2020 because parts of the pandemic, the lockdowns like opened with a Mars-Saturn conjunction where everything just suddenly ground to a halt and like everybody's lives were just on pause involuntarily where lots of people wanted to keep doing stuff and wanted to keep moving forward with their normal life. But all of a sudden there were just these limitations imposed on everybody that stopped you from being able to act. And that's very much sort of the energy here that we see with like Mars square Saturn is what happens when something that normally moves forward quickly and rapidly suddenly runs into a wall and has to de-accelerate de very quickly. 
Yeah, yeah. There's uh, the first image that popped into my mind with the sun and then Mars hitting that square to Saturn is you know hitting an iceberg, right? Mm -hmm. They, um, you know, the, there's definitely a slowing. Uh, uh, there's a slowing down, and with Mars Saturn, you know, we we, we know that both in theory and practice, um, tight, uh, hard aspects between Mars and Saturn, um, you know, generate a variety of dangers. You know, they they timed um, the they they timed the emergence of new variants during COVID. They um, when you have that mutual combination, um, that that sometimes gets called a, a Yama Yoga in Vedic astrology, which is Yama being the god of death, right? It's, it's just harsh. What's I would say what's good about this is because it's so early in the sign. It happens immediately, and then for the rest of the time that the Sun and Mars are in Sagittarius, it's weakening. We're like moving away from that. That's true. That's a really good point. That the critical point is at the beginning, and then there's like a a coming down from that sort of like the slope in this graph from archetypal explorer that has the Mars Saturn peaking on the twenty fifth, and then gradually declining after that just like the sun saturn peaks on the 23rd and then gradually declines after that but yeah it's you know this this month has so many stops and starts where it's like oh are things gonna get better and they get a little bit better and it's like okay and then there's yeah saturn saturn's still there and you know there, there there's it's like a little bit and then mm, still like uh back to a hard reality that needs to be accepted before moving forward yeah, and the thing another thing about just the Mars, the Mars Sun, and just part of the Mars Sun cycle, is that even though we had the exact conjunction of the Mars and Sun on the 18th, Mars is beneath the rays of the Sun. You won't see Mars rise or set um, pretty much the whole month, and then well into December, it, it's gonna, we're going to need to get well into December to actually see Mars. And when we do see Mars, it'll be in the morning rather than nighttime which we've seen for a while um that like the there's no planet that takes longer to re-emerge from underneath the beams of the sun than mars mm, that's a really good point so this is mars's um journey through the underworld so to speak in the same way that venus went through the underworld uh to some extent over the summer yeah that yeah they um because you know there's the the planning and the ideas and you know what am i going to accomplish over the couple years but because it's it's a slower cycle um synodically speaking than any of the other cycles um it takes a while to see what mars is going to look like for it to actually reappear it won't reappear until towards the end of sagittarius or until the sun's near the end of sagittarius so as we're talking about all this it actually brings us to our second lunation of the month which is a full moon in gemini um that basically occurs shortly after the Mars Saturn stuff has gone exact so that it's still fully operative in our lunation chart for around November 26 27th we get this full moon in Gemini at four degrees of Gemini um, and Mars is opposite to the lunation since it's at two degrees of Sagittarius opposing the moon and Saturn is squaring it from zero degrees of Pisces um, also interestingly at the same exact time Mercury which is the ruler of the full moon um, is at 24 degrees of Sagittarius, and it's very closely squaring Neptune, which is bringing a element of lack of clarity in communication, or even like outright deception in communication at this time. And it's curious that that's the aspect that's going exact as the full moon's happening at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's not much help. Um, you know, there's uh. You know, it's like, you know, in a sense, like the, the full moon in Gemini is like, well, let's let's think about it. Like, let's communicate. Let's talk about it. Like, let's try to look at all the options and the um, that that process uh, or practice of trying to trying to look at, you know, trying to do the mercurial thing where you're like, OK, what are all the moves? What are all the what is everybody doing? What are we and what could I do? Like that is um, th that Mercury, that Mercury world process is rough because of that incredibly tight mercury neptune square right neptune 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 just makes it makes the uh, mercury neptune in a sense makes it really hard for mercury to do the job 
of separating this from that, understanding the relationships between things, trying to get accurate information and data, trying to communicate in a way where the information is conveyed. Um, and it doesn't, you know, Neptune doesn't interfere with ne with Mercury in like a, in like a, you know, uh, in the same way that Mars did at the beginning of the month, right? By lacing it with so much hostility or delivering bad news. Um, it just makes it very difficult to see things clearly. Um, so the, the Mercury, so the Mercury Neptune square or the Mercury Neptune, like, um, angular to each other. Um, we're trying to come up for like a name for that a couple years ago in the, the same style as other two planet yogas. And, uh, Kate called it a, a goldfish yoga, which is the, like the, the goldfish not remembering anything from 15 seconds ago. Nice. Which makes it very hard to like do a math problem if you forgot uh, what you were doing 15, uh, 15 seconds ago. I like that. That's really good. The goldfish. Um, yeah. So the lack of clear communication around that time is tricky, especially at a moment where emotions are running high and tensions are running high because it's a full moon in and of itself, you know, which is one of those for whatever reasons, we always hear those anecdotes about like the hospitals being busier during full moons. Um, you know, I, I can imagine that here, especially with Mars being involved as well, and we're just raising the heat and the tension and the um, sometimes the anger in some sense, like around that time of this full moon. Um, but to have things sometimes have eruptions of anger or um, fighting or disagreements as a result of a misunderstanding. I was just watching, there was like a viral clip that just went viral of an old interview between like an actor who was doing a movie, sort of um, a movie promotion tour, you know, press tour and an interviewer. And they had this little exchange and it's really funny because they're kind of like, they're younger, they're in their twenties and they're flirting with each other at first. But then halfway through the, the interviewer is using cards and using like tricks to kind of like show off um, in the interview. And halfway through, they have this exchange where the actor says, you, you know, that, you know, the comic carrot top. And she's like, um, yeah, he's terrible. And then he's like, well, you know, no, I mean, but you're kind of like carrot top. And then she misunderstands that to mean that she, that he was saying that she's a bad interviewer, but in reality, what he was saying is just that she's using props like, like carrot top did. And it was such a great example of how sometimes like a single conversation can flip just based on a misunderstanding, this combination really makes me think of that because then the rest of the interview is really awkward because she's like mad at him for insulting her and he's still tr basically trying to flirt with her or something. And later she gave an interview saying that she was really upset by it, but it was all based on what seemed like a misunderstanding. That is my main image for this, this full moon. That is um, more than sufficiently Neptunian. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just final kind of thought on that one. You know, with the full moon in Gemini, the energy is like, let's go fast. Let's solve all the problems. Let's go really fast. Mm -hmm. And then it's like with the Mercury, Neptune, it's like, well, but in what direction, right? And like, how do we solve this problem? Like not, you know, like the, the energy is very, you know, it has a lot of movement to it, the impetus, um, but it's sort of like, go really fast through a door you don't have the key to or go really fast in what direction? Like, you know, let's get to the restaurant. We're late, but we don't have directions. So going really fast doesn't necessarily get you closer. It could actually get you further away. Um, yeah. It's, it's well, frustrating. You've... And the moon is also square is just coming off that square with Saturn. It's not, yeah. it's not I'm a great that a... full moon. It's like you're trying to go fast, but you've just hit a pothole or like that like flattened your tire. And so you're like trying to drive fast with like one tire flattened. Yeah. And you may or may not be going in the right direction. Right. For sure. Um, yeah. So everybody around the time of that full moon strive for clarity and communication. Understand that even though you may think you understand what was said or what the situation was, you may have a misunderstanding. So that may prompt you to try to move more slower than you're inclined to, and especially try to be not as quick to anger or try to reserve judgment until you get out of that. Because Neptune transits like that are like a, a nebulous cloud that you can't fully understand until you're on the other side of it. And you can look back in retrospect and see 
that you were actually in a cloud that you didn't realize at the time. So see if you can like hold off for a few days on major things just to gain greater clarity if if possible. Yeah, I would um I would not go fast. Even if the speed limit is um, you know, even if there's no speed limit, that doesn't um that's not a suggestion. So speaking of that, that actually would be a good time for me to mention our auspicious election of the month, which is around this time towards the end of the month. And our auspicious electional chart for this month is set for November 30th, 2023, around 1.55 a.m. or around 1.55 in the morning local time. And if you cast a chart for your city and then adjust, set the chart for about 1.55 a.m., adjust the ascendant until it's at around six degrees of Libra or so, basically make it so that the chart has Libra rising, and then you'll end up at the chart with Libra rising and Venus in Libra in the first whole sign house in a night chart which is very positive and very potent. Um, it is conjunct the south node there at 23 degrees of Libra. Uh, the moon is in Cancer in the 10th house, and the moon is around the middle of Cancer, and it's actually applying to, it's coming off of a sextile with Jupiter at seven degrees of Taurus, and it's applying to a square with uh, Venus. So we have very strong rulers of the first and the 10th houses here. So it could be good for Venusian related things, um, that you need to have a positive appearance or positive aesthetic appeal with Venus in a night chart in the first house in Libra. Um, it's also not bad for 10th house things since the moon as the ruler of the 10th is so strong in this chart. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, downside, it has Saturn in a night chart in the sixth house, so it'd not be good for potentially things that involve employees or people that are working for you or potentially some types of health related things since the sixth house can have to do with illness. Um, yeah, but otherwise this is our, our electional chart for, for the month. Yeah. I like the, <clears throat> I like the moon here. It's also um, it's approaching the North bending, which means it's, you know, um, high, higher in the sky than the sun would be, you know, it's very aspirational. Yeah. Well, and I just wanted to take advantage of the most well-placed planet this month, which is that Venus in Libra, by putting it front and center there in the first house. And also, you will notice that this election takes place at the very end of the month, once we've gotten away from a lot of the more tense aspects from earlier in the month and started to get a little bit of distance from those, but also just before Venus departs from her home sign of Libra and goes into Scorpio. Yeah. When you have, so you have the South node, which doesn't help Venus, but Venus is also right next to Spiga. So, you know, um, unhappy face, South node, happy face, uh, support from a Venus flavored benefic fixed star. Right. For sure. Good times. So that is our auspicious electional chart for the month. Um, it's one of several different electional charts that we found for next month that we're going to release on our auspicious elections podcast sometime in the next week. So that's a benefit that the uh, patrons of the Astrology Podcast who sign up through our page on Patreon get access to is one of the tiers. So if you'd like to find out more information about that, go to our page at patreon.com slash astrology podcast. All right. Uh, that brings us back to the forecast and the final week of the month. Are there any other things that we meant to point out or was that full moon because then we're just coming off of the aspects of that full moon, basically the last few days, but there's no real, after the Mars, the Mercury, Neptune square, there's no real aspects that go exact after that, are there? Yeah. I mean, that full moon is yeah pretty close to the end of the month. Right. Let me just click through and think about it. December. Um, let me pull up the alignment. Yeah. I mean, we, we've got, um, yeah, Mercury is, just about done with Sag, but doesn't really get done with Sag until December. So let's leave that for December because it happens in December. <laughs> yeah, um, December but we're, 1st. Yeah, we're getting ready for that. And that, you know, that'll be Mercury trying Jupiter, which is nice. Um, Venus is also not going to be done with Libra in November. Um, so yeah, we've just, I, I think that's, that's about all of the, that's, that's the news, folks. Nice. All right. Well, so that is our forecast for November. There's a lot of heavy stuff still coming up. Um, and I'm sure a lot of heavy stuff in terms of the news and in terms of world events that is still yet to happen. Um, but we will continue 
you know, like astrologers have done for thousands of years now to do that dual process of both trying to look and and record what events happen under specific astrological alignments each month in our time and write that down so that we can pass it on and share it with you as part of the tradition, just like the ancient Mesopotamian astrologers did on like cuneiform tablets three, 4,000 years ago, um, but then also look ahead to the future and try to look at what some of the major configurations are and then let you know what, what it looks like is coming up. So um, yeah, this was great. Thanks a lot for doing this episode with me. This is a heavy episode that I know we both prepared for a lot and were, were nervous to get into, but um, I'm happy with all the stuff that we we got into today. And I think we covered a lot. Yeah, we did. We did. Yeah. yeah I hope we we tried really hard to do a good job. It's not easy stuff to watch happening. It's not um, super fun to talk about. Yeah, for sure. But this is part of the job and it's kind of, in some months, it's a corner we paint ourselves into by talking about contemporary events, but then it's also good sometimes to be able to document this and share it with people because I do think astrologers, that can be part of the process of living, not just living through historic times, but also sometimes coping with really difficult or really traumatic events is this is how astrologers deal with things is by looking at the astrology of it. And sometimes I feel like even um, when each of us encounters tragedies in our personal lives, sometimes we resort to astrology to understand things. And that can sometimes in some small ways bring some solace, um, even if it's not, you know, a major thing, but, but hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. I mean, seeing, seeing events is not isolated, but part of larger patterns, um, you know, uh, the, the, it can be, helpful sometimes it's healing sometimes it's not helpful but um it, it at least is um fully contextualizing things it doesn't make things worse and sometimes it's helpful yeah that's good i like that i'll take that that's a ringing endorsement of i'll put that on the description of the astrology podcast so um what do you have coming up over the next month what are you working on what do you got going on uh, so let's see what do i have going on um I meant to do this last month, but you know, October is kind of crazy. Um, so I meant to get up a bunch of lectures and workshops that I've given and were recorded, finally get those up on the website. Um, I'll get that done um, before November over the next week. Um, so a bunch of stuff, uh, workshops on planetary pairs and three planet combinations and lectures on astrological magic and timing technique. I've got a just a, a whole library um, that I haven't put up yet. Um, and then I, I will be, uh, um, sort of further into the future in December, I'll be doing a big intake into my year one program for people who are interested in that. Um, please sign up, uh, for on the waiting list on the website. Um, the, um, uh, the invites don't go out to just the mailing list they, and they don't go out publicly. They just go out to the waiting list. So please sign up to the website if you want. Uh, if you'd like to uh, join the year one program in December. Um, uh, speaking of delayed things, the um, uh, the Saturn and Aquarius series that I elected for Spear and Sundry will finally be out um, any day now. That was also a an October thing that got delayed. Um, not surprising that a an extremely dignified Saturn in Aquarius series would... Um, uh, w would tell us to wait a little bit. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's not shocking. That actually means it's working. If it were a Mercury and Gemini series, then I don't know if that would be a good sign. But this is Saturn and Aquarius, wait for the right moment. So that will be out uh, through Sphere and Sundry, I don't know, probably within the next week, maybe week and a half, but you know, any day now. And uh, yeah, that's what I've got going on. Awesome. What are your websites? Um, so it's austincopic.com and spearandsundry.com. Cool. All right. Um, as for me, my primary things, everybody should watch this Eclipses episode I just released. A huge amount of research went into it, and I feel like it's probably one of the most important episodes I've ever done, and we discovered a lot of cool things. So the title of that, just Google Eclipses that aligned with pivotal moments in history, and you'll find it. Uh, I may do a possible follow-up episode or Q&A episode, because we've always already continued to find 
other eclipses in history. And I'm really encouraging people to take our methodology and start applying that to different areas. And let us know if you find other eclipses that we overlooked that coincided with important moments in history in the past in different areas of like culture, history, the arts, or whatever. I'm sure there's a ton that has yet to be discovered. And if we get enough, maybe we'll do a second episode. Um, second, we're soliciting Saturn return in Aquarius stories um, for our basically every few years we'll do a re retrospective where we'll talk about how the different Saturn return stories went for people that just finished their Saturn return. So if you have Saturn in Aquarius, then you should send in um, your story. Go back and watch the previous episode episode titled Saturn Return in Capricorn Retrospective in order to see what our previous episode was about and how that went. And then you'll have an idea of what we're looking for. So email us at theastrologypodcast at gmail.com with your Saturn return story. Please keep it concise. So first write a one, a one paragraph concise summary of your Saturn return story and what happened. Then you can write a longer three to four paragraph, basically like page write up. Um, but submissions with reliable birth times are prioritized. Please include your birth data. Please include an image of your chart from astro.com, preferably cast in whole sign houses. Um, conciseness and clarity and relevance to the chart are going to be prioritized in terms of we're going to get a lot of submissions. So the best submissions will have the highest likelihood of going to the top. Um, include your birth data. Bonus, if you also include, in addition to your write-up, a one-minute video summarizing your Saturn return story that may be included uh, in the, the, the release of the episode, but this is strict to keep it to one minute only, and we'll disregard any that go over one minute. Um, and yeah, so that's that for Saturn and Aquarius stuff. And then finally, the last thing to announce is just after many, many years of encouragement, I finally got Nick Diggin Best to release his solar fire database, which has over 20,000 charts built into it in three different categories, which are natal charts, just thousands of natal charts. Um, he has another file on American history and then a third file on British history. So this is a large downloadable astrology database that can be used in solar fire or also in astro gold. He, he told me later that can, it can also be imported into astro gold. It represents over 30 years of research on Nick's part. We drew on it for our eclipses episode. And one of the things that's cool about it is you can use solar fire's powerful search features in order to search the database for different combinations. So one of the things I did last night was I searched his database for sun mars conjunctions in scorpio and all people that were born with those and it came up with one of the lists that i used earlier in this episode so it's super useful for empirical research um, we're charging just an introductory price of twenty dollars for now after we've launched it but we'll probably raise the point the price at some point in the future so if you want to get in on that introductory price just go to the astrologypodcast.com slash database to get a copy of it and you can download it right away um, you've that's, seen that's awesome. I didn't know that. Uh, I didn't know that that was happening. That's yeah, it's fantastic. kind of a big deal. I mean, well, he's a Leo rising, so we got some eclipses going on in his like third and tenth house, and and this is a big deal. Finally, releasing his thirty years of research. Yeah, well, and having that that Venus retrograde back and forth over Leo, for yeah, sure, like, for sure. You know, visibility is a big uh, big part of that. Let us see it, Nick. Let us see the data. Yeah, for sure. All right, so the astrologypodcast.com database, and otherwise that's it. I'm going to keep doing podcasts next month. I got a lot of good stuff coming up. This was a big month on the podcast already, but um, I'm going to keep doing it. So my birthday is on November 1st. I'm going to take a little break and enjoy that, but otherwise back to it at the podcast the following days. So thanks for joining me for this, Austin. This was great. Yeah, yeah, this was good. Not particularly easy, but um, good. Uh, good. I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm happy with what we did here. Yeah. I think we did the best that we could given the circumstances and I'm, I'm pretty happy with it as well. So we'll check it again in again next month and see how yeah. it went and see how things turned out. Thanks everyone in the audience. A bunch of patrons joined us for the live stream here today, which is available to patrons of the astrology podcast. We appreciate you. Lots of your comments were super useful. I appreciate it. And thanks everybody for all your support of the podcast over the years. It's the only reason I'm able to do this research and keep cranking out episodes like I do, like the Eclipses episode and everything else. So thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. All right. That's it for this episode of the Astrology Podcast. Good luck next month, and we'll see you again next time.
Special thanks to all the patrons that helped to support the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, shout out to the patrons on our producers tier, including patrons Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Jeannie Marie Kaplan, and Melissa Delano. If you appreciate the work I'm doing here on the podcast and you'd like to find a way to support it, then consider becoming a patron through my page on patreon.com. In exchange, you'll get access to some great subscriber benefits, including early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the forecast each month, our monthly Auspicious Elections podcast, which is only available to patrons, a whole exclusive podcast series called the Casual Astrology Podcast that's for patrons, or you can even get your name listed in the credits. You can find out more information at patreon.com slash astrologypodcast. If you're looking for a reliable astrologer to get an astrological consultation with, then we have a new list of astrologers on the podcast website that we recommend for readings. Most of the astrologers specialize in birth chart readings, although some also offer synastry, rectification, electional astrology, horary questions, and more. Find out more information at theastrologypodcast.com slash consultations. The astrology software that we use and recommend here on the podcast is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available for the PC at alabe.com. Use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we recommend a software program called Astro Gold for Mac OS, which is from the creators of Solar Fire for PC, and it includes both modern and traditional techniques. You can find out more information at astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount. If you'd like to learn more about my approach to astrology, then I'd recommend checking out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune, where I go over the history, philosophy, and techniques of ancient astrology, taking people from beginner up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. You can get a print copy of the book through Amazon or other online retailers, or there's an ebook version available through Google Books. If you're really looking to expand your studies of astrology, then I would recommend my Hellenistic Astrology course, which is an online course on ancient astrology where I take people through basic concepts up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. There's over 100 hours of video lectures as well as guided readings of ancient texts, and by the time you finish the course, you will have a strong foundation in how to read birth charts as well as make predictions. You can find out more information at courses.theastrologyschool.com. And finally, thanks to our sponsors, including The Mountain Astrologer Magazine, which is a quarterly astrology magazine which you can read in print or online at mountainastrologer.com. And the Northwest Astrological Conference, which is happening both in person and online May 23rd through the 27th, 2024. You can find out more information at norwac.net. Mm -hmm.